Nations Northeastern Region Convention in 2020 due to COVID. With its success, it became a springtime annual event. Today, NERX is the Northeastern Region's annual virtual convention jointly produced by the Northeastern Region and NMREX teams. While NERX features clinics and layout tours similar to what you will find at its annual in-person fall convention, its producers are working to find ways to offer unique segments that distinguish it from the in-person fall convention. In 2024, NERX will be broadcast during March 18th to 21st on YouTube and Facebook, and everyone is invited to participate, either by providing content for the event, watching the event, or both. NERX showcases what is happening in the Northeastern region and sharing it with the Model Railroad community. So let's take a deeper dive into what NERX is. The Lakeshores Division and NMRA Northeastern Region are introducing a new hybrid concept for a make-and-take clinic called Build It. The Build It series will begin with NERX in 2024 and finish at Lakeshores 24 next September's in-person NER convention in Rochester, New York. Jim DeMarco, a master model railroader in the Lakeshores Division, has been hosting the Lakeshores Build It clinics for the past two years. Jim will be leading the clinics, showing members how to scratch build a wooden boxcar. Build It will be open to anyone that wishes to participate and build along with Jim step by step, but is aimed mainly at those who are new to scratch building. Realizing that modelers may not want the expense of buying large amounts of strip wood that may or may not have a future use, a packet of materials will be available at cost there will be enough material to build two cars or fix errors in order to finish one car. Jim's pre-recorded videos during NERX will cover construction of the basic boxcar body, including the floor, ends, siding, roof, roof walk, trucks, and couplers. The video clinics will be archived so participants can review and work at their leisure. Here is where the hybrid make-and-take concept comes in. Participants during the NERX build-it sessions can bring their car shells to the NER convention in Rochester for final detailing, such as doors, grab irons, ladders, brake rigging, etc. The current plan during Lakeshores 24 is to have one traditional clinic coupled with a learning table set up for the duration of the event where participants can work with Jim or another mentor. The live clinics at Lakeshores 24 will be limited to 20 participants, but the detailing steps will also be recorded for completion of the project at the modeler's home workbench for those not able to attend the convention. When the modeler returns home from the Lakeshores 24 NER convention, the only thing left for the modeler to do is paint and decal. And when completed, the goal is to have a scratch-built merit award-worthy car, giving participants the confidence to build them. During the last NERX virtual convention, we added a new feature called Tips and Tricks. Tips and Tricks are nothing more than a scaled-down version of a clinic but focus on one tip you want to share with the viewer. It can be about modeling, electronics, operations, or any other model railroading tip that you know, as long as you can explain it or show it in five minutes. The tips and tricks are pre-recorded for NERX, too. So if you have a great tip to share with your fellow modelers, consider recording it for NERX. We use these tips and tricks to fill space in between all of the other great activities during NERX. After all, who wants to watch advertising slides while waiting for the next segment to begin? We sure don't, and we made those advertising slides. So think about some of the things you do in this great hobby that can be explained in five minutes and would like to share. If you need help recording your tip or trick, email us at the address below and we will try to help. At a typical in-person convention, the layouts you get to see are layouts owned by members of the host division or are other layouts located near the convention hotel but with a virtual convention, you get to see a sampling of layouts from all corners of the region. With the Northeastern region covering parts of Pennsylvania, northern New Jersey, most of New York, all of New England, eastern Canada, and Quebec, there are nearly 1,500 members within its borders. That means there are a lot of layouts out there, and we are working hard to get them seen on NERX, but we need to hear from you. It doesn't matter the scale you model in, whether you model a prototype or freelance, if you are interested in eastern or western railroading, if your layout is complete or in process, we are interested in having your layout shown. All of our layout tours during NERX are pre-recorded to fit a 20 to 30 minute time slot. If you have a layout and would like for it to be shown during NERX, but don't know how to create a video, reach out to us using the email address at the bottom of the screen and we will work with you to get your video done. Help make NERX cover all corners of the region by volunteering to show your layout. 
What have you been working on since the last NERX virtual convention? We are sure everyone has been busy at their workbench, layouts, or behind the camera over the last year. The model showcase is a popular regular feature of NERX where members can share their work. During every night of NERX, we will show the work of our members in between the clinics and layout tours and on the NERX website. This is not a contest. There is no paperwork. There is no judgment. There are no awards. There is only the sense of pride when sharing your work, work that may inspire other model railroaders. So if you have been working on some projects over the last year, share them. Locomotives, scenery, cars, structures, and anything else model railroading are fair game to share during NERX. In process or completed work doesn't matter either, nor does scale. Just identify yourself, write a description of the work, the scale, attach several photos, and send it to the email address listed at the bottom of the screen. One of the unique segments offered during NERX is a nightly roundtable discussion. These discussions bring together a handful of subject matter experts with a moderator to discuss a specific subject. In addition to the Q&A segments after a clinic presentation, this is the only other segment of NERX that is live instead of pre-recorded. Past topics have included layout command control, or LCC, social media's impact on the hobby, women in model railroading, engaging families in the hobby, and deeper dives into model scales other than HO. For 2024, we plan to continue bringing interesting discussions, including a preview of the in-person Lakeshore's 2024 Northeastern Region Convention being held in Rochester, New York. We also plan to have discussions with layout owners that manage a regular work crew to build their home layout. What do they have to do to make sure everyone is having a good time, progress is being made, and materials needed for the next session's tasks are available are just some of the things we want to hear about during the discussion. Meanwhile, there are other layout owners living in small spaces that will only fit a small layout. What are the challenges they face and decisions they make in choosing what to build? This will be a separate discussion during NERX comprised of layout owners meeting this challenge and enjoying the hobby while doing it. Speaking of enjoyment, we will also meet some women in the Northeastern region that are doing some great modeling in the hobby. Last year, a new special interest group, Women in Model Railroading, was launched. Let's find out what the latest news is with the SIG and take a peek at what they have been modeling in this final roundtable discussion for 2024. Like layout tours, clinics are one of the activities found at a typical in-person convention. The National Model Railroad Association is a nonprofit organization and the cornerstone for its nonprofit eligibility is the education it provides to model railroaders. One of the ways it accomplishes this are through clinics at conventions and other NMRA events. These clinics can be on a variety of model railroading topics. Clinic presentations on railroad history, the latest technology such as 3D printing, laser cutting, DCC and LCC, scenery, model building, operations, layout design, and more are found at these events. During NERX, clinics are also offered in the program. The clinics are pre-recorded, have a length of 40 to 45 minutes, and are followed by a live Q&A session with the clinician. If you think, I can't do that, think again. Remember, you are not presenting to a live audience. That eliminates the fear of being in front of a group. Plus, the topic you are presenting is something that you are passionate about. Is there anyone more qualified to present a clinic on the topic than someone who is passionate and knowledgeable about it? And if you do not know how to record your clinic, we can help, just as we have helped many other NERX clinicians. We are always looking for new clinics, and if you have one to offer, email us at the address located at the bottom of the screen. And that, my model railroading friends, is NERX. I am so glad you asked. But here is a reminder of a few things from the presentation. Remember to participate, either by volunteering to give a clinic, layout tour, or tips and tricks, make a submission to the model showcase, participate in the Build It program, and of course, watching the event on the NMRA's YouTube channel or Facebook page. You can contact the NERX team by sending an email to info at nerx.org if you need help preparing a video. And you can keep up to date on what is happening with NERX by visiting the website at nerx.org or reading the emails about NERX in the spring. Now, be sure to make tracks for NERX on March 18th through 21st.
Welcome to the last and fourth day of NERX, the virtual convention of the Northeastern Region of the National Model Railroad Association. NERX is bringing you four nights of clinics, layout tours, and roundtable discussions. We also have a model showcase featuring submissions from members across the region. You can see all of these entries on our website at www.nerx.org. My name is Mark Moritz and I will be your host for this evening. We appreciate your time and hope you enjoy the content we are providing. You can send comments and suggestions to info at nerx.org. We also have links on our website to all the clinics, layout tours, roundtable discussions, and tips and tricks for this year's events, as well as all of our past events. We would like to make a special shout out to Ray Arnott at Around the Layout podcast for helping to promote our event. Check out aroundthelayout.com or download it from wherever you listen to your podcasts. They produce a new one every Tuesday. We would also like to remind you that we have a total of four $50 gift certificates that were donated by our sponsors, Mini Prints and Interaction Hobbies. The instructions on how to register for the drawing can be found in the show notes for this event. You can be one of the four lucky winners, so register now. The drawing will be held live tonight at 8.45 p.m. You need to enter the drawing before 8 p.m. Thank you to Bernard Helen at Mini Prince and Daryl Jacobs at Interaction Hobbies for again sponsoring NIRX. Mini Prince is also an NMRA partner and is offering a 15% discount on all regular priced items to all NMRA members. Check out the members section of the NMR website for the discount code. If you like what you are seeing and would like to make a contribution to support the activities of the Northeastern region of the NMRA, then please consider making a donation. You can go to www.nerx.org and click on the donate button at the top of the page. Please make sure to put your questions for the clinicians in the chat. We will have our clinicians on, us, on with us live after the clinic video to address as many of the questions as we can. So let's get started. Our first presenter tonight lives in Moncton, New Brunswick and is active with the Eastern Canada Division. He serves as a member of the ECD board and is that division's achievement program chair. He also coordinates the ECD's monthly third Thursday Zoom seminar series. His primary modeling interest is centered on the Canadian National Railways and he enjoys building rolling stock and structures from scratch and kits. He has recently designed a modular layout based on a maritime branch line theme and is currently scratch building a wharf and a lighthouse for the first section. He states he feels very lucky to have met many fine NMRA members over the years who have all freely shared their knowledge. Attending many seminars and learning new techniques has been a huge benefit of NAR, NMRA membership for him. An NMRA member since 1971. So please welcome MMR James Watley. Thank you for the introduction, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, thank you for uh, the invitation to participate. <clears throat> Tonight, I'll be giving a presentation on sprucing up a train show boxcar. Something for everybody in there, I hope. So without further ado, I'll ask Speed to please play the video. Hello, everybody. My name is James Watley. I'm a member of the Eastern Canada Division of the Northeast Region of the National Model Railroad Association. And the talk is uh, sprucing up a train show boxcar. Now this is geared towards uh, newer model makers, but there's a lot of tips and techniques that may appeal to more experienced people. So please join along. We've all seen uh, older rolling stock available for sale at train shows at very reasonable prices. Although many of these models are not as highly detailed as present day manufacturing can achieve, it's quite feasible to upgrade them using easy to learn techniques. The results are very satisfying and these projects are quite fun to do. Using the common Athern Blue Box boxcar kit as an example, this presentation shows how to bring the detailing up to a much higher level. Similar upgrades are applicable to many other cars of this and later generations. Following its introduction in 1957, thousands of the Athern Blue Box 40-foot steel boxcars were produced 
in a bewildering variety of road names. Luckily, undecorated kits are available, but starting with a pre-painted car is just fine. If you have to strip the paint off a car, it's uh, recommended that you do. And you can use one of the uh, many commonly available methods such as 99% isopropanol alcohol, brake fluid, polyscale ELO if you can find it, or other products that are compatible with styrene. Uh, Gugon, which you can get at hardware stores, is, apl is applied with a Q-tip and is very helpful for, for removing stubborn lettering. Prototype photos are very useful for detailing and they are widely available on the internet for practically every type of freight car ever made. So this is a photo of the car I'm gonna to try to achieve here. Atherne boxcar kits were very basic and there wasn't much for the modeler to do, thus earning the name Shake the Box Kits. However, despite the rather heavy molded on details, the basic body molding is fairly accurate and has lots of potential for upgrading with extra detail. Now, the first thing you might want to do is to remove some of the heavy molded on details and substituting finer replacements. And this will go a long way towards enhancing the model. For example, the lower door tracks are over scale on this car and they were snapped off after scoring with a single edge razor blade. Now it's very important from a safety point of view to think about where the knife or blade might go if it slipped and place your fingers accordingly. So notice I'm holding the car from the bottom. So if the blade slipped, I would uh, hopefully not have any fingers in the way. The existing roof walk on these cars is also too heavy for scale and was removed. It simply pries off. The mounting holes were plugged with 1 8 inch diameter styrene rod that were filed to match the existing roof ribs after the styrene cement dried. The end ladder vertical rails are spaced too closely uh, to be prototypical and they're candidates for total removal. You can remove these and other molded surface details using tools such as the number 17 X-Acto chisel blade. Hobby grade versions of dental picks and scrapers are also very useful for getting in between ribs and other car body features. Jewelers files, especially the curved riffler style shown here, are helpful for carefully smoothing out the end contours. You just work slowly and have some patience and it's not that difficult. A variety of sandpaper and sanding sticks applied in increasingly finer grades is used to polish out any remaining scratches. In the lower right, you can see an example of uh, typical sanding sticks uh, and other materials that you can get at hobby stores. The side ladder rails on this car are actually correctly spaced 18 inches on center and may be retained with only the molded on rungs removed. The rivet detail in this case is saved. Note that the Exacto number 17 chisel blade has been ground down to better fit in the narrow places. And also note the blade's edges have been rounded to lessen the chance of gouging. So if you look right over here, you can see that I've rounded off the corners, it tends not to bite in as much. So new vertical end ladder rails were cut from 40 by 40 thou styrene, and they were aligned by transferring the 18 inch side ladder rail spacing. Machinist dividers are ideal for transferring these types of measurements because of their very small sharp points. Now a vernier caliper may also be used, but actually I prefer the uh, dividers for this. And they don't have to be an expensive pair. They could even be uh, uh, a set from a school geometry set. The side ladder vertical rung spacing was also carefully transferred to the end ladder rails. So notice on the left, I've taken the spacing between the rivets where the molded on uh, rungs were, and I'm moving that over to the end. Now to keep them in horizontal alignment, I used a small square 
to transfer the measurements around the corner with a small pencil. And the dividers are also used to locate the pairs of drill starter points on both the sides and the ends. And I've then taken a machinist scriber and I've used that to gently enlarge the drill starter points established with the dividers. But you don't need a fancy scriber to do this. You can just put a dressmaker's pin in the end of a wooden dowel or an old brush handle and that works fine on styrene for this. Now the holes for the ladder rungs were drilled with a number 80 bit held in a pin vise. You need to go slowly and gently applying very little force and you let the tool do the work. So my hand there is not pressing down on the tool, it's just positioning it. And I'm using my thumb and forefinger to turn the pin vise. But you let the tool do the work and you need to sort of feel the load on the little drill bit. Um, you don't apply any pressure, especially not sideways. But it's not as hard as it looks. Um, if you practice on some scrap material, uh, it's not hard to get the hang of it. And again, uh, with the dividers uh, set to the, the required 18 inch center to center ladder rung spacing, I've marked that point on the jaws of a small pair of pliers with a piece of tape. And then I use that mark to bend uh, ladder rungs from Tishy 10 thou phosphor bronze wire, and they all come out the same. And the individual ladder rungs are installed in the holes drilled using tweezers. And then you come along with uh, some super glue and apply it with the tip of a number 11 blade. Now, regarding super glue, uh, which is officially known as alpha cyanoacrylate or a ACC, uh, for example, the crazy glue brand. It's a very, very effective adhesive and I use it a lot in model making, but it must be treated with respect due to its ability to bond skin very well. So I strongly recommend that you wear safety glasses and I also recommend uh, using the brands that come in polyethylene jars, tubes or vials over those packaged in the miniature toothpaste tube style with crimped ends that can fail and end up gluing the tube to your thumb. And it happened to me once. Dispense a drop of super glue on a pallet such as a margarine container lid and transfer a tiny amount to the model using the tip of a number 11 blade. You could also use a pin, which is shown right here. Uh, do not dispense the ACC directly from the tube to the model. You'll get too much and it will be a far greater probability of ruining the surface. So I continued building the end detail up using prototype photos as a guide. And the retainer valve and the lower brake rod clevis are tissue parts. The brake step braces were bent from 5 thou brass strip and the other details were bent from Tishy Foster bronze wire. Now, notice I saved the Atherin brake step. It's not bad. It's just the braces are a bit clumsy, so I use separate little strips of brass. The geared power handbrake housing was plugged, and it was re-drilled to accept a Katy brake wheel. So the brake wheel that comes with the Atherin car, as somebody once said, would require giant hands to operate. And the KD part is much finer. There's many others, uh, many other brake wheels made as well. So the next thing I tackled was the doors. And it turns out that the Tishy corrugated door happens to be a very good fit on the Atherin car body. And it has much finer features than the original. You need to put in a few small bits of styrene to fill a couple of square openings in the car body. And a couple of small details need slight trimming to get the tissue doors to fit closely. So you notice this latch here I had to trim out a little bit, but it's pretty easy to get them to fit. And I made tack boards from bits of styrene strip assembled on a piece of masking tape. And then I trimmed them after the glue dried. Now you can buy these. I just didn't happen to have any and it's extremely easy to make your own, so why not? 
Now this car that I did actually buy at a train show was uh, owned by somebody else who had started some work and then stopped. And uh, so I basically fixed up an area where they had uh, attempted to remove the side grabs. So I did that by drilling the holes larger and I plugged it with styrene rod and then sanded it smooth. And I made new end grabs using small slices of 60 thou evergreen styrene channel with overlong pieces of 10 thou styrene rod. I used the styrene rod here rather than wire because it's easier to stick it on to the uh, brackets using the compatible styrene cement. Once everything's dry and cured, I trim the rod to final size and it makes a nice neat job. Now the Athern underframe was assembled with the scribed wood floor facing down and the steel weight on top, contrary to the kit instructions. Now there's two floor projections that stick through the edges of the doors that need to be trimmed off. And then you put the center sill and cross bearer casting uh, back on. And the resulting assembly still fits properly inside the car body, but it looks much better with the weight hidden. It's not entirely prototypical, but it's far better than it was. Now, a stock KD number five coupler box was installed by trimming back the existing Atherin center sill. The floor was drilled with a number 50 drill bit, and then it was tapped or threaded for a 256 pan head machine screw. It's very helpful to first mark and drill a pilot hole using a smaller bit, say a number 67, which is about half the diameter of a 50. And this ensures a better location accuracy in case the larger bit tries to wander. And also the original Athern uh, plastic wheel sets were replaced with inner mountain, which just snap into the trucks. Now, the excessive car rocking typical of these kits was corrected by carefully filing down the kingpin box, which allowed the truck screws to be tightened a bit further. I also needed to add a 15 thou KD fiber washer to correct the coupler height. That happens to fit right around the boss perfectly. And you can also leave one truck slightly looser than the other, which creates a pseudo three point suspension and makes the car ride better. And another th another trick is that notice the truck screw has a pan head that nicely fits the truck bolster and helps reduce side to side play. So those are some tricks uh, to make your cars uh, run better. Now the existing Atherin brake cylinder, triple valve and reservoir are inc incorrectly molded in the mirror image of the prototype. So I trim them off and I relocated them in the correct positions using the excellent diagrams provided in the Cal Scale or Tishy AB brake set. And I made the piping and brake rods from 10 thou and 15 thou Tishy phosphor bronze wire and placed according to the diagrams. Now, why do I use Tishy wire? It's a little harder than brass wire, still easy to cut, but it forms nice crisp bends and it's very straight as you get it out of the package. So it's very nice to work with. Also, uh, the original stirrup steps on the Athern car are way over scale. So I snipped them off with a sprue cutter and replaced them with closer to scale A-line parts. So to do this, uh, the first thing I did clockwise from the top left, I measured the center sen center to center distance of the mounting pins using the dividers. I transferred that measurement to the required locations on the car body. I drilled the holes out with a number 21 or number 75 drill bit, which is 21 thou. And that's a little bit larger than the pins to give a little room for glue. And then I attached the steps with ACC. I bent the coupler cut levers to shape using pliers using the prototype photos as a guide. Now you can buy eye bolts, but they're easy to make. If you put a steel dressmaker's pin in a small vise, now the steel pin is a hardened steel, so it's good for this purpose. 
and you make a tight loop of uh, wire right around the pin. And then you just snip off the excess part of the loop with wire cutters, maybe a few little adjustments with pliers to get it to be flat. And then you just drill mounting holes with the number 80 bit. And so the uh, new cut levers are bent also from the same wire and you just thread them in and attach them with a little bit of super glue. I used CalScale air hoses. There's lots of others um, available. I just used a small piece of uh, brass tubing as a coupler. And uh, some people choose to retain the KD trip pins for operational purposes and others like to snip them off for the sake of appearance. It's up to you. I made a new running board from individual pieces of northeastern basswood strip that I gently sanded to remove any fuzz. Now you can also uh, get very good aftermarket um, um, expanded metal roof walks for later era cars from people like Plano. I preferred to backdate this car and make it a wooden roof walk era car. I pre-stained these pieces to give them a weathered gray look by soaking them for a few minutes in a mixture of black leather dye in about 125 milliliters of methyl hydrate in a jam jar. And I spread them out on newsprint to dry. Now I use Fibing's leather dye. Uh, there's other brands, I believe, and uh, the choice is yours, but the dye is an alcohol base and it, mix, it mixes really well in methyl hydrate. So uh, it's a good solution. And you get a nice silver gray appearance. The longer you leave it, the darker you get. So it's up to you what you like. And this method is very, very useful for all sorts of structure models, especially bridges and trestles. And the effects can be varied using uh, brown and other shades of dye. And you can do this on styrene using a variety of painting methods, like for instance, painting the styrene a tan color and then overpainting it with streaks of uh, various shades of uh, dark gray or light gray. So the running board was taped to the roof and uh, I glued the end walks with carpenter's yellow glue to the running board, not to the roof at this point using carpenter's yellow, group, yellow glue. The end walk grab irons were also made from the Tenthau wire. And uh, I, in this case, I chemically blackened them using Jack's brand of jeweler's pewter black, but they can also be easily painted ahead of time so you don't run the risk of painting the wood. And uh, I kept at this point the whole running board assembly separate to simplify painting the roof without having to mask it. So that's as far as I went with this car. Now there's more you could do, but uh, these this amount of work will certainly change the car and give it a uh, closer to uh, prototype appearance. Now we move on to painting. Now airbrush, brush painting, sorry, has its place, uh, but you can obtain a uh, very even finish on rolling stock models by spray painting. Now I used on this project a different approach using a commercial red oxide primer by Krylon rather than a paint specifically marketed for model use. I'd like to credit Taylor Main for finding this close match to the CNR red number 11. It's very important when using spray paint to read, understand, and follow all the manufacturer's safety instructions. Use of a properly designed and vented spray booth is recommended for all indoor spray painting. So it's very handy to attach painting handles. And in this case, I glued a stick of wood into the body using medium viscosity super glue. This can easily be snapped off later. I used a piece of 14 gauge copper wire attached to the floor using the truck screws. And I attached the trucks them themselves to a piece of wood dowel or some other piece of stick. 
Now, if you don't have an airbrush, the model may be sprayed directly from the can using a couple of light passes and allowing uh, 10 minutes or so drying time between the coats. However, in this case, I decanted the spray paint into an airbrush for finer control. And it's easier than it looks. You basically aim the spray into a short piece of drinking straw that you place in the airbrush bottle and surround with tissue. Probably don't want to be wearing your Sunday best clothing to do this just in case, but it's actually easier than it looks. So the handles make painting a breeze. So for the wheel sets, you use the handle to roll the truck back and forth in parallel with the airbrush spray. And you can add uh, rust and other shades to the wheels later using a micro brush and a similar rolling, rolling motion. And then you immediately clean the wheel treads with a pipe cleaner dipped in thinner also by rolling the truck. And then afterwards, you can hang the uh, parts up using the same handles. So there they are drying. And uh, probably a couple of days is a good time. Make sure the paint is very well cured. Now, in this case, I used a flat primer. So a light coat of gloss coat was sprayed on right out of the can to ease the decal application. Decals don't work as well on a very flat surface. However, I'll speak more about this a bit later. Now, the lettering begins by carefully comparing the prototype photo and the decal placement diagram that usually comes with the decals. And making note of body seams and other features that are on the car body are very useful as placement guides. Now the decals themselves were applied over small puddles of micro set and allowed to dry untouched after quickly adjusting their final position. So you have to kind of bring the decal over to the model still on its carrier sheet. You approximately hold it in position and then with a pair of tweezers as you can see there in the photo I just sort of slide it into position, make final adjustments, and that's it. And sometimes you need to think of uh, creative ways of holding the model to make the decal application easier. In this case, the end lettering. So just simple things you can do. Once the decals were dry, Microsol was used to help all the decals settle into the surface contours. Now I chose to represent the car with a well-used in-service appearance rather than brand new as it was shown in the builder's photo. So after a couple of days to ensure the decals were thoroughly dry, I applied a light spray of Vallejo Ultra Matte. This is a very uh, durable finish and um, it's quite flat. It's extremely good for applying weathering over. Now, I also, uh, in this case, applied a very fine mist of the body color to tone down the stark white of the decals. Again, you have to go very lightly on that step. So I installed the roof walk, and uh, then I applied some additional weathering using pan pastels applied with a variety of very fine, short, bristled brushes. There are other pastels as well. I've tried, I, I find pan pastels are very, very good for this. And uh, applying them over a flat finish is necessary to ensure good adhesion. Again, uh, studying prototype photos to observe where dirt typically collects, for example, on the body steams, very helpful. Now the oxide red shades of pan pastels are good for uh, representing the last vestiges of paint. In this case, I tapped gently onto the roof walk. So it looks like there's a little bit of paint left, but most of it is peeled off and the wood underneath has turned gray. And then I gave a very, very light coat of Vallejo Ultra Matte to seal everything in place. Now, as an aside on the painting, I did some additional experimenting and I found that you can uh, you can uh, skip the step 
of applying a separate gloss overcoat by mixing about 25% gloss right into the matte finish color. And that produces a satin finish. So deckling over that is very effective. And the big advantage is the elimination of excess paint film build up in extra steps. Now, some people use um, acrylic floor finish for this as a separate step, but again, um, you can skip that step and use the compatible uh, uh, gloss mixed right into the paint. And I keep recipe cards for my formula so I can recreate it. And here's a test piece I made. I just sprayed a piece of styrene. I deckled it. I put some Vallejo Ultra Matte and it went very well. I also uh, did similar testing using the Vallejo brand of paints, which come in the model air, which are thinned for the airbrush, and the model color lines, which are a little heavier for brushing. But they're also flat paints. And uh, when I mixed in their gloss, I also was able to get very excellent satin finishes that also worked well for deckling. In fact, Vallejo endorses this approach. They have an application note in the document at that link there. And uh, they they basically mentioned doing exactly this, which I discovered uh, after I tried it. So this is the recipe I used for the model air. And I put 10 drops of model air to two drops of their gloss varnish and one drop of their airbrush thinner. I found that their flow improver wasn't required in this case. And I, as you can see in the upper right, I made up a test card and took notes of what I did. And similarly for model color, I found that seven drops of paint and three drops of gloss varnish with three drops of thinner uh, did the trick. I tried a number of different recipes and uh, these two seemed to work out the best. So how much did all this cost? Well. I got the box car at a train show for $5. And the wheel sets, these are in Canadian dollars. The wheel sets were three and so on. And it all adds up to $21.78. So it's about a third of the cost of a ready to run uh, contemporary box car model. And yet you've done all this work yourself. And produced an equivalent result, hopefully. So there's the finished product. And I've done it like a baking show where I start off with the unmodified kit, the modified kit, and the painted kit. So to conclude, enhancing an older kit is an excellent low cost way to obtain a better detailed model with very satisfying results. There is a huge scope of potential project choices available. We have an embarrassment of riches in terms of prototype photos available on the internet. We are free to choose just how far we wish to take the upgrades, as little or as much as you want. This type of model building contains several mini projects, providing opportunities to learn new techniques that are useful on many other models. We end up with something unique and can say, I built that. So just go out and get started. So as Porky Pig would say, that's all, folks. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, James. That was a very informative and excellent presentation. Uh, we have a number of questions that came through on the chat, and I'd like to ask you some of them. Um, the first question was, if you have one of these cars, do you need documentation or more information? I think they mean what kind of documentation or, or plans do you need in order to go ahead and do one of these revisions to a car? Uh, drawings are nice if you have them, but um, it's not essential. A lot of people... Uh have done very successful work in this area with just a couple of good photographs of a prototype car. 
So there's not that much information that you need, just uh, a good photograph. Yes, and the internet is just full of them. I mean, I think practically every freight car ever made, you probably have some chance of finding a picture on one of the uh, websites for that. What other brand and type of cars lend themselves to these techniques, in your opinion? I think any of the uh, plastic models, um, Lifelike, Bachman, Athern, um, you know, anything made in the last uh, 40 or 50 years would be a candidate. The main uh, consideration is um, how close is it to a prototype car that you would be interested in building? So in other words, how much uh, modification is necessary? And I purposely chose this project in the example here uh, to be fairly close to a boxcar I was interested in doing so that you're not talking about major surgery like cutting the car length and rejoining pieces and so on. That would be for probably a second or third project when you get a little more experience under your belt. So try to choose something on the easier side and and try your best at it as a first project. Okay. Um, we had a question about what you mean by a train show car. Are you referring to swap meets or RPMs? Or oh, yes. Well, show? yeah, there's different terms. I guess different people use a swap meet for sure is what I'm thinking of or flea market or anything like that. Okay. Something where there's tables full of good stuff for good prices. Okay. We have a question here. Can you use putty on these cars? Um, I would also ask if you use putty, uh, what do you use? Because what I used to use, squadron putty is no longer available. Uh, if you need to uh, smooth anything out, yes, putty is uh, a way to go. Um, I use squadron as well, but I, I never really liked it 100% because it did have a bit of a tendency to flake. And I actually use... Um, 3M Bondo uh, automotive spot putty mm. and it it's available at hardware stores and automotive supply stores and uh, it's just a uh, easier to work with more durable product okay I've used that on cars but I've never thought to use it on model railroading uh, equipment well it just so happens it sticks very well to styrene and so we fell into greatness in the hobby Wow. Um, what sort of dental picks and scrapers do you use and where do you get them? Uh, you can get them online. I bought mine actually at a swap meet one time in a little set. Uh, up here in Canada, we have a chain of stores called Princess Auto. And they have all kinds of little pouches in the 5 to $10 range with tools like that. Um, maybe Harbor Freight in the States might have them. Uh, but you can uh, order them online as well. And uh, you get the kind that have kind of like a curved end with a sharp undercut. Those are good. Um, there are uh, just round picks. Um, there's, there's a variety of uh, little scraping type tools that you can get. They're very inexpensive. I think yes. it works out to about a dollar a piece, the ones mm. I bought. Mm-hmm. We have a question here. How do you round the exacto blade? I assume they mean the blade you had that was a 17 blade that you narrowed. Yes, uh, I have a grinding wheel, a bench grinder in my workshop. So I just took it to the bench grinder and uh, reduced the blade the way I want it. You uh, have to be careful about not overheating the blade and taking out the temper. So you keep a little jar of water nearby and frequently cool the blade as you're grinding it. It's also a job for safety glasses. And mm -hmm. of course, when you turn the grinder on for the first time, you never stand in front of the wheel as it's running up to speed in case it fractures. But a simpler approach is to just buy a little honing uh, piece of, um, I can't, carborundum and just run the blade back and forth. It'll take you a lot longer than a grinding wheel, but it will also do the same thing. Okay. A uh, question I had is, what is methyl hydrate? It doesn't have another name. It's methyl alcohol. Methyl alcohol. Okay. Methanol. Yeah. Methanol. Okay. All right. 
and it's available. It's uh, obviously available at hardware stores, home improvement stores. You can get it in uh, one liter, four liters, whatever you want. Okay. Um, how well does yellow glue hold the board to the plastic shell? Actually, in this project, I did not use yellow glue to hold the roof walk to the shell. I actually just placed the roof walk and the end walk on the shell to get the correct angle of the end walk. And I butt glued the end walk to the roof walk with yellow carpenter, carpenter's yellow glue. But the roof walk was later glued onto the roof with CA uh, oh, okay. after I painted it. Okay. I didn't explicitly say that, I guess. Do you remove the rungs on the side ladders and replace with wire, or do you remove the whole ladder? Well, you could do either. In this case, I chose to uh, leave the vertical rails and remove the molded on rungs because the rails are in the correct spacing and they've got a nice little rivet detail which simulates the uh, attachment for the uh, rungs. But you could just as easily take the whole thing off and then you've got a couple of options. You could use a commercial ladder like a Tishy. They make a very good casting, so do other people. Or you could uh, put two pieces of 40 thou, 40 thou evergreen styrene on there and drill it out and put rungs on. There's all kinds of choices. But okay. either way, whatever you do will look better than the molded on Athern ladder. Okay. Um Another question, does the finish you applied hide the edges of the decals well enough? The yeah. uh, questioner found that some decals have harder to hide edges. Yeah, they do. Um, but uh, if you apply the decal with uh, microset and then later on follow it with microsol, you should be able to um, get it to uh, snug in tight to the car. And then when you... Uh, uh, put on your clear coat, that should really uh, be adequate if the decals have gone on properly. Now, I also, if you recall, added a step where I sprayed the car with a very fine mist of the body color, which is the first step in weathering in, in this particular case. So I toned down the stark whiteness of the lettering to simulate a car that had been around for a while. So that in itself has the added advantage of um, helping to partially hide the decal a little bit, then your okay. clear coat will really finish that off. Okay. <clears throat> uh, another question. Uh, I have never used Black Cat decals. How are they? Black Cat are very, it's a very nice product. They're very, very accurate, I found, for any of the uh, prototypes that I've purchased decals for. Uh, so their research is good. Uh, I, the printing is very similar to Microscale. I find them pretty much the same, and I, I don't uh, experience any real difference in using them. Okay. Uh, we have a question about testers dull coat. Do you can you use dull coat testers dull coat as a sealer? Fluid dull coat sprays much of the pan pastel off the project. Any suggestions? Well, actually, uh, Chris Carfaro last night in his very well done uh, presentation on painting talked about that. And he basically uh, talks about holding the spray over the car and letting most of it draw into the spray booth fan and enough will fall in the car to fix your powders without um, blowing them all away. But in the case of the pan pastel, that particular product has adhesive in it. Not all artist pastels do. And Chris actually talks about this in detail. So you could go to YouTube on the NMRA archive and look up his presentation at your leisure. But basically, uh, I found that the, uh, the uh, pan pastels work quite well in this application. Now, you don't want to be going hog wild with the yellow coat or other spray. Like you wanna be at a distance and just mist it on and move quickly. But 
you will find some diminishing of your powders, but it's it's not too bad with Pan Pastel. Okay, that's good. Uh, last question: Do you feel phosphor bronze wire is hard to bend? Not at all. I um, the the particular hardness that Tishy sells is what I use, and uh, I use it because it's harder than uh, brass. Uh, a little bit harder than brass. Some of the brass wire that I was finding in recent years, like for instance, from Detail Associates, was rather on the soft side. Now you can fix that if you put one end in a vise and the other end held in a pair of pliers and give it a yank, you can uh, introduce a little bit of work hardening in the brass wire. But I just find a lot easier to work with, uh, with the Tishy Phosphor Bronze product and it solders very well in any applications where soldering is involved. Okay, well, thank you very much, James. Um, that was a great presentation. And I think the uh, number of uh, questions we got is indicative of how much the audience enjoyed it. Um, our next presentation is by Dave Inslee on wire wrapping current transformers. It's a tip and trick. Following that will be Weathering Wood by Jeff Hankey. And finally, Model Showcase Part 4 by Chuck Diljack, MMR. I'll, I'll say good night to everybody then, and thank you for having me. Thank you, James. Um, Speed, you want to uh, roll the video? Okay. What I'm going to demonstrate here is I needed to find a way to solder some wires to the leads of my current transformer. A current transformer is a device that's going to be used to do occupancy detection on my railroad. Um, I bought these current transformers from RR circuits. Um, the instructions tell you to use wire out of a CAT5 cable. So what I have is this wire, which is already a twisted pair. There's four twisted pair of wires in the CAT5 cable. Um, so I took one of those pairs, I cut it to the length I needed to reach my um, BOD8 um, board and then what I do is I kind of pull back, unwrap about two inches of wire. First thing I'm going to do, which I always forget, is to take some heat shrink tubing and put it on the wires. I'm going to do this because once I solder the wires to the leads of the current transformer, I can't put that tubing on unless I unwrap the whole thing. And I don't want to do that. All right. So I have this tool. This tool is a wire wrapping tool um, from Jonal. Johnard tools, which I got on Amazon. It's got both a place to strip the wires and a device to wrap it, as well as unwrap it, um, which hopefully I never have to do. So this is 24 gauge wire. So I'm going to use that 24 side. I'm going to expose about one inch worth of the, the wire and I'm kind of push it over the little, there's a little slot in there. And then when I'm done, I can do that. I got it in there and I can strip the wire off. All right, then I'll do the other side. Again, I'm on the 24 gauge side. I go about an inch in and I'm stripped. All right, again, I'm going to start with a white wire. Um, in my tool, you'll see there's two different holes. Um, if we can see that or not. The top hole is where the wire is going to be inserted. The center hole is where the lead from the current transformer goes. So I take my wire, I stick it into that top hole, and as I insert it, you'll notice it comes on the outside of the tool right here along this channel. Um, so I'm going to take, again, I usually have the white wire on the left lead. So I'll insert the left lead into that center hole. I don't need to go all the way in because um, I've only got about an inch of wire and it's going to tightly wrap it. But I hold the, the wire against the current transformer, push, put a little pressure with the tool towards the current transformer, and then I just start to twist. Um, keeping that pressure, I twist until it's done. And you'll notice you get a nice tight wrap of the wire. All right, now I'm gonna do the other side. Again, I'm gonna stick the wire inside the um, tool. I'm gonna find where the hole is.
push it to the coating is off and then I'm going to insert the lead of the current transformer into the center hole. Again, make sure this is all in there nice and tight. Um, hold the wire against the current transformer and then I twist, keeping pressure against the current transformer. All right, there we go, nice and simple. All right, so I got the two leads um, wrapped. Next thing I'm gonna do is just put a little bit of solder on this because, um, well, it'll all hold together better that way. So I put a little bit of liquid flux onto a little container lid. I'll use a micro brush, dip it into the flux, apply a touch of flux to the lead and the wire, and I'll do that on both sides. Next, I'll take my hot iron, tin it with a little bit of solder, and literally just kind of touch it to the... And again, just got a little bit of solder on there to hold everything in place. Last step in this is I'm going to bend the wires back down so it kind of follows the leads. Push my heat shrink tubing over it. And I use the soldering iron to just kind of heat it up and shrink it down in place. Oh, and there you have it. I've got a wired up current transformer ready to do current detection on my layout. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, this is Jeff Hanke. I'm going to give a quick uh, and easy little tip here. Something I've used for many years to weather uh, scribed siding so that it looks like the paint is peeling. First step is to paint both sides of your piece of wood. The reason for that is we're going to add alcohol to it and you don't want it to warp. So don't forget about painting the back side. I only painted one side here so you can see on the left what uh, the material looks like originally. And this has just been painted with uh, black uh, primer paint just so that you can see uh, it clearly, hopefully on the video. All right, the magic tool to do this scene is this right here, a curved blade that is very, very dull. Do not use a normal number 11 X-Acto uh, blade as that will dig into the wood and uh, really damage it. This dull round blade has worked uh, miraculously for me over many years and uh, continue to think it's uh, perfect just the way it is and never replace it. So once you have the uh, siding painted and you wanna make it look like the uh, paint is peeling, what you do is just take the blade and scrape it across the plastic. And the more dull your blade is, the more you'll have to scratch at it. If you use normal um, acrylics, uh, they won't be as thick as these, and so it will actually um, come off a lot quicker and a lot easier. How much you want to do uh, paint peeling, completely up to you. Uh, just continue to uh, scratch at the paint, and as you can start to see, some of the natural wood starts to come through. And how much, again, this is all technique and feel for you as to how you want it to look. We're going to go for a little bit more of an extreme look just to make uh, the point here when you're doing it. So, secret here to getting a good look. You can see some of that paint starts to look like it's starting to uh, peel off is to make sure that the wood has different layers of um, weathering. So any of the exposed wood right here will actually darken once I give it a wash. And this wash is very simple. I'm gonna be using Tamiya XF1. Just take a little dab, throw it into the 70% uh, rubbing alcohol here. Makes a nice little wash. Add that wash to the 
part that you actually uh, scraped. And what it'll do is it'll darken, just to give you an example on the unfinished wood. It just barely darkens it. See, it's not, it's not too dark at all. And that just gives kind of a look like a grain of the wood um, so that when you go back and do the technique a second time, you will uh, have a very nice multi-layered effect. So here, this part's been done. If I was to do it again after it dried, I would have let it dry. I will see bright wood once I scrape away the area that has been washed. And hopefully between these two spots, you can see the difference. So this one had the wash on it and this one hasn't. So once this wash dries, scrape it again. And once you scrape it, you'll have wood that's this light, wood that's kind of this medium color, and then some of the original paint color on the, on the wall. And it makes for a really unique, good looking technique for uh, weathered wood. You know, the paint peels, you want it to peel. You can go crazy with this technique if you'd like and use the tip to, to try to work on the tops of the um, pieces of wood because basically when you do this, the tops tend to peel first on the, on the uh, ones that are most exposed to the rain and most exposed to the um, sun. And so you can kind of do a different technique here if you'd like. Just, just focus on that top edge. And that'll be another, another look of having the uh, uh, paint peeling. And then once you're done and you're happy with the way it looks, these are, you know, looks, looks okay, uh, seal the whole thing with dull coat. And then uh, you're good to go. Pre pretty quick and pretty easy. And again, the magic tool is a curved blade, not a straight blade. And then layer the effect. Make sure you use washes. And in no time, your uh, model buildings would look incredibly realistic with peeling paint. Take care. Bye. Welcome to the final installment of the 2024 NERX Model Showcase. Over the course of all four nights, you will have the opportunity to see all of the models submitted to the showcase. Now for the finale, part four. Allied Electroplating is an HL scale structure and diorama scratch built by Bruce Shepard, a Lakeshores division member using evergreen styrene sheeting over a skeleton of black core foam board. The finish was accomplished using the hairspray paint chipping technique. The end staircase was assembled from scale lumber. On the diorama base, Bruce used a combination of dirt, static grass, and commercial grass tufts. The foundation and loading dock was cut from foam core, wrapped with masking tape, and then stippled with artist gesso. After painting and weathering, this gives a nice dilapidated concrete appearance. Chris Cafaro of the Green Mountain Division did some custom painting of six O-scale cylindrical hoppers shown in the next three slides. Chris brought all six cars to NMRA weight and met the wheel and coupler standards. The Agway diamond-shaped herald was handmade based on the customer's request. Two pairs of Penn Central hoppers painted the same colors have one car weathered more than the other in each pair. On all of the hoppers, paint was stripped, the cars repainted, and decals applied using decals from Highball Graphics. All were weathered with an airbrush and pan pastels. Chris also applied weathering and decals to this O-scale GP9. His techniques included using an airbrush, pan pastels, liquid chrome, and Tamiya flat finish. Dennis Colucci of the Hudson Valley Division custom painted two N-scale locomotives for his railroad, the Balfour and Colucci Creek Southern.
B30-7501 and B40-8562 began their life as Atlas models, a cotton belt and BC Rail locomotive respectively. They both received alcohol baths and scrubs to remove the existing paint, then Dennis added his own custom paints. Using custom decals he designed and had printed by Fusion Scale Graphics, he lettered the locomotives before weathering them. Ed O'Rourke of the Central New York Division took this photo on his previous layout at the end of the last operating session before abandonment and dismantling. He is currently working on a new New Haven layout in a new home. And that is a fitting end to the model showcase for the 2024 NERX Virtual Convention. The NERX team thanks everyone that shared their work. For our next NERX presentation, we have a group to discuss how to assemble a crew to work on your model railroad. To lead this discussion, please welcome Drew James. Hi, everyone. I'm Drew James from the Central New York Division. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'll be the roundtable. Um, I'll be the moderator for this roundtable, um, which will include Mark and Joe Valentine and Gary Muncie. And we're going to talk about uh, work crews on your home layout. Um, as a bit of background for myself, um, in 2015, my wife and I bought a new house that had kind of everybody's dream basement. I had 1,500 square feet dedicated to my model railroad. So I'm building a very, a fairly large layout. And I knew that if I was going to finish it in any sort of reasonable time, um, I would certainly need help from my friends. And and I, I started work sessions and and got a got a lot of help from a, a number of friends from the NMRA, um, and it worked out great for many years. Um, I thought I would uh, take two years to get trains up and running, and it only took one year because of all the help I got. And uh, continued the work sessions really up until the pandemic. So, how about you, Gary? My name is Gary Muncie. I live in Pepperell, Massachusetts. I'm a retired uh, railroad employee, 30 years uh, for New England Railroad uh, as a train dispatcher. Um, <clears throat> I cheat River Railway in my basement. I started in May of 2008. I was a member of, of a model railroad club that closed down about that same time. We actually moved to another location. And uh, I wasn't ready to make the move. And a friend of mine said, well, why don't you build a layout in your own basement? And I said to him, well, look at my basements in shambles. So he actually helped me build my first yard section. It was kind of modular. Um, then I'd go to tr area train shows and I'd see my, my old friends from the other train club. And they, what, what are you doing these days? I said, I'm building a layout. So they started coming and helping me build the layout. Um, we are still working on it. We're fully operational and, uh, we're winding down with uh, several scenery projects. Um, and again, these same friends, they come over and then uh, the, we do the work parties together. Joe. Good evening, I'm Joe Valentine. I'm part of the Garden State Division. <clears throat> I started building this railroad more years than I care to mention. I too work for the railroad, which doesn't give you a lot of time at home. I was at a train um, flea market, I'll call it, one day, and a fella came up to me and said, you want to join the NMRA? We'll give you a free membership. Six months, you find out if you like it. So I said, okay, well, what have I got to lose? And I joined that, that group, and ever since I joined that group, that's where I met Mark Moritz. I met Jim Walsh, uh, the fella that uh, introduced me to the NMRA has passed away, but I've met many, many people. And basically I've had friends that have come over and helped me continue the building process. I did have the layout running for an open house, uh, but now we've gone into scenery and we're kind of stuck on scenery. And uh, we meet once a week for a work session and it's coming along. It's, uh, it's, 2,000 square feet, so 
it's it's a project. Yes, it is. How about you, Mark? Well, I'm Mark Moritz. Uh, I uh, started my current model railroad in what then was a, a newly purchased old house uh, nine years ago. And uh, I worked by myself for a while because I had to tear out the old rooms in the basement and put put in new walls and new floors and new ceilings. And once all that was done, I was ready to start a layout. It took me a long time to plan, but I finally got it uh, on paper and uh, started inviting people over from the NMRA to help me because it was going to be a big project for just one person without help. And we've continued, we've continued to have uh, weekly uh, meetings where we get together and work on the model railroad. Uh, ever since then, um, Joe mentioned he knew me through the working group and uh, I work on his on Thursday nights with a group of people and then we all come over to my house on Monday nights and work on mine. So we have a very nice uh, mutual helping relationship. Um, but uh, without all the help I get, uh, I wouldn't have accomplished very much on my own. Now, Mark, you and you and Joe said that you meet once a week. I, I know in, in my case, it was much more ad hoc. We, we met about every week at the peak periods, I'll say, you know, every one week or two weeks. It wasn't it wasn't a planned night. It wasn't that everybody knew that on a certain evening. It was usually on Saturdays um, that I would, uh, you know, just get a group of guys together, email them, and let them know we'd be working on a Saturday or a Sunday. Um, what about you, Gary? Is yours kind of a, a regular, regularly scheduled event, or is it more ad hoc? Or well, I did forget to mention I am a member of the Hub Division. We got to promote the Hub Division as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kind of ad hoc. Um, I sometimes schedule my work sessions a, a, around a couple of my the members of my group and, and their availability. Um, a couple of them are very talented, and I try to schedule the work sessions around their schedule. Um, right now, I do pretty much a Thursday afternoon, starting about one o'clock after lunch, and it's mainly retirees. Um, you know, uh, a very close from nine is another rare retiree that that comes to my group. Um, the other one's a truck driver, and he's very talented as well. And he's pretty much, you know, laid off for the winter uh, in the construction business. Now he's going to be starting back up again the construction season. So I'm probably going to move my work nights probably to an evening night so I can accommodate his schedule. Um, Sometimes we do it once a week, sometimes it's every couple of weeks and all kinds of depends on my schedule as well. Yeah, much more like me. I know when I was starting the way out, I was working and so it was, mm -hmm. hey, when can I, uh, you know, have a Saturday free? When I, when I was still working for the railroad, I worked a Monday day shift and then second shifts during the evening. So I actually did a Monday night session after I got home from work. So. Yeah. So maybe uh, a good thing to talk about next would be some of the advantages and maybe some are obvious you can move things along faster and maybe some aren't as obvious so so does anybody have any you know ideas on what are the advantages of getting a work group together well i'll, I'll take that one first um we all look forward to it as a social event as well as a working event uh, it's it's the same night every week and uh we we have a routine we work two to three hours and then we socialize for an hour and it's uh it's very therapeutic among other things it's uh uh a time to to meet with people that you uh have learned to uh care about and work with and uh i i find it to be very uh very good in that respect i'll continue yeah. at that point um I have to agree with Mark. It is the social aspect. Uh, it's great having everybody around and people to talk to. My wife passed away 11 years ago. And so it was post uh, after she died that uh, I started with the group. So it's a, it, it is a, um, a good social outlet for me. But above and beyond that, when you're handling 
heavy wood and building bench work and things like that, it doesn't go twice as fast just because there's two, two of you. It goes three or four times as fast. You're not constantly uh, stopping to clamp things so that you can drive a screw. You have somebody there to hold it. And it, it, it does speed up the process. I was never interested in finishing, so to speak. My feeling was that the fun is in the building. Uh, I do operate on other layouts, but for me, the good part is, is building the layout. So that's the advantage to me of having the big group there. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on to what you were saying about progress. There certainly was the social aspects, but for me, it was a few things. One was, it was absolutely amazing how quickly you can make progress. I was blown away at times when on a Saturday, uh, you know, it, those of you who've been in my basement, I have two peninsulas, a large one and a smaller one. And the bench work for the large peninsula went up in one Saturday. And, you know, just the amount of progress that you're able to make, as Joe was saying, with, you know, four or five guys in the basement that are somebody's out cutting the lumber, measuring, you know, and just mm -hmm. the, the bench work just I couldn't believe how quickly it went up with the help I had and also a track laying. And so, you know, it, you know, progress went so much quicker. And then the other thing that has been mentioned that I'll mention is just the variety of skill sets. Um, I knew that I could not have the layout I dreamed of just using my own skills and that I really needed to leverage other people's skills. So, um, you know, Bill Brown, for example, has done basically, you know, scenery clinics on my layout with a, a group of us um, to, you know, help move the scenery along. And Ken Cameron, you know, doing the JMRI work, things that would have taken me a long time to learn. Um, so just bringing the diverse set of expertise and skills. You know, I didn't know how to lay spline roadbed. I do now. Yeah. Yeah, so how about you, Gary? Well, um, a lot of my, we were, as we were building our Cheat River Railway, we were actually operating it. Uh, you know, <laughs> we wanted to operate it. So even if we only went, you know, 20 feet into the basement, we'd, we'd run a train out there and switch a couple of sides and come back. But um, a lot of my layout, I say our layout, because it's a group, right? It's a group of guys that's built my layout. Um, to be honest with you, I never spent a dime on lumber. Everybody <laughs> donated lumber and a lot of a lot of my group members uh would actually build sections at home uh drew you brought me on my layout um you know i've got a couple of like you know areas it's like a shelf layout and a very good friend of mine would actually build those sections at home and bring them in and we didn't we'd install them on the layout um and you talk about the social aspect um our work sessions we used to start at 11 a.m and we'd work about an hour and a half, and we'd order out for lunch. I'd go pick up the lunch at the local pizza shop, bring it back, and then we'd watch railroad movies on our big screen TV in the living room. <laughs> and then we'd go back to work on the layout. So, and you talk about the people with talents. I've got a great electrical uh, guru who comes. He's an older gentleman, but he's a very intelligent person when it comes to electricity. And he does all my electrical stuff for me. Uh, Right now, we're, he's installing uh, traffic inter, uh, intersection, uh, a three-headed uh, traffic light for a roadway intersection. It's going to actually work. So, Now, how, how did you all form your groups at the beginning? Did you give like an open invitation to, say, your division or, you know, or did you make particular invites? How did, how did you form your groups? Well, I'll, I'll start with that. I. Yeah. Again, word of mouth, um, you know, I, I told a couple of people, a couple of co-workers from the railroad would come over and, and work in the group. And, and I, like I said I, earlier, I, I'd see some of my friends at the, uh, at the train shows and uh, how you doing? You know, what are you doing these? I'm going lay up. Oh, can I come over? Sure. And, uh, and that's how my group got formed. I, you know, my operating group, I, 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 I send out about 20 email, uh, 20 different emails for my, for my operators. Um, for our work sessions, I get anywhere from three to six 
at an operating session of, out of the same group. And like I said, it's all been word of mouth and uh, just email notification when I'm going to do an e a work session. I started by emailing particular individuals that I wanted to have involved. And uh, <clears throat> some of them have stayed with us all this, these years. Most of them have moved on to other things, uh, moved away, retired and moved, that sort of thing. But uh, word of mouth is very important. Uh, those people knew people and those people knew people. And uh, I basically don't turn anybody down. If someone is interested in working, uh, I invite them and they come. I remember Mark's comment when I said to him, hey, there's somebody else that would like to come down. Is it okay with you? And his comment was, the more the merrier. <laughs> and and it really uh, worked out well. They became part of Mark's group. Some of them became part of my group. We don't live around the corner from each other. It's a 45-minute drive from uh, Mark's to my house. But, uh, you know, except for things like vacations, we're there all the time. And, and we look forward to it. It means somebody said to me, well, we didn't meet at Mark's this this Monday, uh, I kind of lost track of what day it is. We're all retired, so uh, it's very important. To, uh, it's a, it's a part, becomes a part of your life. I, I know in my case, I had uh, my previous layout was um, a much more modest size layout, but but it was uh, operational, and I used to host op sessions on it. So I I kind of had a group of uh, friends. Um, from operating on my layout and on their layouts um, or just people who are regular operators on kind of the, in the central New York area. And so, you know, those were folks that I knew and seen their layouts and knew what they knew, which was really important and um, was able to, you know, just basically just reached out to, you know, that group um, of, you know, operators, if you will, to see if they had helped me and, and as Gary said, kind of word is word of mouth is when you when you are starting off to build a you know a good size layout that's really geared for towards operations that kind of gets you know a group of people excited in the area and they and they want to help out in any way they can. Um, so yeah, so that'll work out well. So so there was some discussion earlier about you know socializing being a big aspect of this and and. Uh, uh, you know, I agree. It certainly is uh, uh, an important part of it. How, do you guys, you know, how do you balance the socialization versus the productivity? Is there a balance or do you not worry about it? Do you have to crack the whip? What, what's your view of that? Well, I, I don't. I don't crack the whip. I mean, they're volunteering their time coming over to my house and working in my basement. Um, yeah. There'll be, you know, several times they'll be sitting there talking to politics or not a lot of politics. Mainly, <laughs> mainly, like we shut that down. <laughs> um, but uh, um, railroad, railroad subjects in general, you know, what's what's the what's the latest uh, thing that the railroads doing in our area? You know, and they, you know, they socialize. That's fine, and uh, you know, and they still work. So when people come over to my house, if if I wasn't there. Or if I never said anything, they would socialize and talk politics for a half an hour to an hour. Uh, I always let them do some of that because they need to. But after 15 minutes, I start assigning jobs to people. When they come to my house, I used to raise cattle. So I have a couple of cattle prods. <laughs> <laughs> that should but work. Everybody... Uh, we meet upstairs in, in my family room and everybody stands around for about 15, 20 minutes and talk. And, and I hand out water bottles and I say, OK, let's get it going. And some people go down there and they're self-starters. It's very interesting. Uh, and, and other people, they wait for you to tell them what they are going to be doing that night. So it, it's all well and good. And I, I mean, I, I feel totally blessed with the people that that come down here. Um, one of the fellows is in the other room right now because he helps me set up the computer because this is a foreign land to me. But Jim always says, you know, I say, can you do this? And he says, while I can, I will. And I mean, he's the guy who crawls under your layout and gets his head bloodied from standing up too soon. 
but he's in there all the time. And I have a fellow who was a signalman on the uh, railroad, and he does the wiring for me. When he came, I said, Ed, what do you like to do? He says, I like to wire. I said, anything else? He said, wire. So when you get somebody like that, you're very happy. And for a lot of us, uh, I worked on one other fellow's uh, layout years back, an engineer, and uh, I said to him, uh, I've never done this before. He says, good, you can practice on mine, mess it up, and then you'll be able to do yours better. <laughs> and and he was right. And I said that to people now, don't worry about it. It, it. Whatever you do, it's fine. We can always fix it. We can change it. It's... Um, I, I don't get crazy on people. Like, yeah. And Mark doesn't either, despite the fact that he said he has to prod us, which I, is it, true in a way. Yeah, you know, I, I think to a large extent, the productivity versus socializing is, is uh, you know, being productive, a lot of it is really on the layout owner, I think, and and how mm -hmm. they view it. And, and, and also, I think the key, what I found is, if you are organized and ready, your crew will be highly productive. So, and, and what I mean by that is you have tasks that need to be done and you have the tools to do them and the materials to do those tasks with. So when, if you, you know, if you have the lumber you need to build that bench work, or if you have the track ready to lay down and you have the track laying tools there, people will be very productive and they'll continue, you know, working when, when the socializing would really kick in lots of times was when maybe you didn't have as well-defined tasks or the work was kind of running out or you needed more material, right? That that's always lousy when you need to run to the store in the middle of a session. Um, but, you know, I found having the tasks ready to go and having the materials and the tools really um, made people productive. But yes, I agree, I agree with talk. that. <laughs> I, I agree with that. Uh, part of having a, a, a group is having the work prepared for them ahead of time so that when they come, they can get to work. Um, which brings me to the observation that when I have up to 10 people here, uh, I find myself being the gopher, running, <laughs> running to the workshop and getting the tools they need and bringing them back and finding they need something else. Or another, another pair of guys needs something else. I have to go and get that. So I spend a lot of the evening running back and forth and then you can't find something. You have to put it away or you put it away so you can't find it. You know, that's kind of thing. So um, I think as your group gets larger, you spend more time uh, getting them the things they need even during the session. Yeah, absolutely agree with you, Mark. It's uh, sometimes I wonder if I'm a model railroader or I'm just a foreman in charge of bringing <laughs> stuff in. Uh, but I mean, that's fine. They're doing the work. And, and one of the things I do is I say, here's, this is your project. I'm handing it over to you, whatever you do. And they'll come and say, well, what do you think of this? And I say, it's your project, whatever you do. There's another fellow that's building wow. a huge mountain uh, for me. I mean, it's two or three feet high and it's probably 20 feet long. And he's doing the plastic. I, I did the castings, but he's he's putting them up and everything. And he has a very good eye for it. So he's going along, he's doing that. And he'll say to me, what do you think? And I'll say, Scott, it's your project. I couldn't do it any better. And when you think about it, you really can't. You may have done it differently, but it, having folks like that, it's just wonderful. Now, do you, now in my case, I, I did a lot of work on my layout in between the work sessions. So I was going down every night and doing work um, as well. Um, and there were some tasks that I did kind of keep to myself, if you will. And the main one for me was the wiring um, underneath the layout um, for, I guess, two reasons. One reason was that's I didn't have somebody like Gary was mentioning who was real excited to go and spend an evening crawling underneath the layout. But also, I felt it was really important to understand the way the layout was wired so that I could debug it. So if I'm in the middle of an op session and something goes wrong, at least I have some sort of a, you know, I have a, I 
what it could be and how things are wired up. So that's kind of, you know, that was a task, for example, where that I kept to myself because I thought it was important to, to understand what was, what was the wiring. Were there any, you know, jobs that you felt like you need to keep to yourself or how did that work? Well, for example, uh, I've got a new, uh, one of the new members of my group, he, uh, he joined our local model railroad club uh, last spring, a year ago. And, uh, and I just, uh, I said, you want to come and check out uh, my layout? And uh, he did, and he loved it. And he started coming to work sessions, but he doesn't have a layout himself and he's learning and he's not too much younger than myself <laughs> and retired, but he wants to build a layout, but he had no, no idea what to do. So I gave him a simple task um, and I got to do a promotion for Bill Brown and his Lark products because I use his backdrops. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I had several backdrop pages printed out and I said to my friend, uh, says, here, this is what you do. Uh, very simple. You, you know, you cut out the sky, you do it, you line up, make sure you cut the edges perfectly, put some more Elmer's glue on the back and put it up. And he did a, one set of photos and, oh, he's been like, four sessions and I don't even have to tell him how he just grabs the photos and I took, I show him where I, where I want them and he puts them up and he does a great job. But other than that, you know, I really don't do a lot of work on, on, on the layout construction myself. Uh, and I didn't do much work. It, it was all the guys in the group. I just supervised. <laughs> so. Well, I had about two thirds of the bench work done by my, while I was still working and it was in October of 16 that some uh, visiting group wanted to see what I was doing and they came down and a couple of them hung around and they, they helped me do things to straighten out the basement. I, I'll never forget when Mark and Jim were first working on some track and we had a gooseneck lamp <laughs> because the lighting was horrendous. But when you're working by yourself, you don't really care. But since then, uh, We've uh, spruced up the basement, shall I say. Uh, probably did everything backwards, put in a drop ceiling after the layout was up and lighting and all that. But now at least you can see what you're doing. Uh, but the people have been terrific. My feeling is that my job is to tell them what I, what my vision is. What, what am I looking to have it look like? Uh, Jim and I took a trip down to the Delaware Water Gap and he's a damn good photographer. And he took a lot of pictures and I have them set in the area. And, you know, when they say to me, well, do you want this? Do you want that? I said, there's the picture. Whatever you can do, I'll be eternally grateful. And I want to give a shout out to somebody on the from the round table last night, uh, Angela Sutton. She has recently joined the group, probably over a year now. And she has a tremendous uh, skill for seeing the way things should be. And she's an architect, so she can do things freehand that I can't do with a pen and a ruler. So it's very helpful. And before I get in trouble, I need to give a shout out to my girlfriend, Kathy, who's an artist. When I did the uh, river, it looked like a, uh, a mud hole. Uh, she came up and she used some uh, just regular acrylic paints and she did the bay, the river and helped me uh, put the uh, coating on it. And it, it's just beyond anything I could do. So you, there, there are people out there that are, are more than happy to help you and they have more talent than you'll ever have. Mark, is there any, uh, you know, kind of tasks that you felt like you needed to do yourself or were you willing to let everybody, you know, go, go wild? Well, I don't let anyone go wild, but I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I supervise everybody. I, uh, I give everybody a lot of uh, personal discretion to use in terms of doing various jobs and everything comes out all right. Uh, when something doesn't come out all right, then I will go back during the week and change it. And I won't say anything about it. I want people to being enjoying themselves and have a sense of uh, accomplishment uh, without criticism. Um, one of the things um, 
I'm sensitive to is the, the, the diplomacy involved in, in working with the group. Um, I try not to have it be that they're trying to get my uh, approval so much as they're just trying to enjoy themselves and come up with something nice as a result. Um, and uh, I, I want to add, uh, I met a very experienced model railroader who had a big layout that was widely regarded as being really top notch in the area. His name was Harold Worthwine. He's deceased now. He ran his model railroad and had operating sessions until he died at the age of 96. And when I was getting ready to do the, uh, the group, I said to him, how do, you, how do you get them to do all this work on your model railroad? You know, he had a crew that would come over and work on it. He said, I feed them. <laughs> he feeds them, meaning he, he gives them food to eat while they're working, after they've been working, whatever. Since then, I've been uh, having a, uh, a little social hour after each work session where I feed them. And I think people look forward to that. You're right. You hold out the goodies till after the work is done. <laughs> And and that's the way it has to be. I, I do the same thing, but one of the things I learned from Mark was enough with the chips and the sodas. Now we have juice, we have fruit, we have cake. <laughs> <laughs> so we've dropped the chips and the sodas and we've opted for something slightly more healthy. Now, now what, what I have found is that people tend to gravitate, of course, to the tasks that they enjoy, which usually means they're good at that task. And mm -hmm. they're usually better than I am at that task. And I quickly, you know, learned that and was able to leverage that in the group. So you could, you know, we were building scenery, I'd have, you know, a few guys over and I could say, hey, go and, you know, build a mountain in the corner here or do, you know, whether it's, you know, do whatever needs to be done. And they almost always, I, can, I cannot remember a single instance where I felt like I could have done something better myself. The, the other thing I've learned, and I know it's true when I go to help somebody on their layout, is I actually think people are more careful on somebody else's layout than they would be on their own layout. So when I'm laying track, when, you know, when I was helping somebody lay track on their layout, I'm being very particular and making sure that everything is perfect because I don't want there to be a derailment or something where, because I was, you know, didn't do a good job in the track laying. And I've found that to be true also, where when I've seen, sometimes I've had to tell people like, just move on. This is good enough because they're, you know, being very particular. And I think that that is, you know, I, th I think there's a natural kind of a pressure almost to, to want to do things better for somebody else than maybe you would accept if you were doing it on your own layout. I agree. Yeah. It, it, I can it, remember ripping things up on Mark's layout and redoing them because they weren't satisfactory. <laughs> and you know, as it, it was a new experience for me. He has HON3, and that's really difficult for me. But, boy, we worked at that cleaning track and laying track and trying to get it just so. Because if you don't have it just so, those little suckers just leave town. Have, have, you ever, have any of you, like, had to set standards for a task or something like that? No. I didn't. Uh, again, you know, several members of my group are more talented in different areas than I am. Um, so I didn't really have a set standard. I just, uh, I, you know, like Joe said earlier, uh, you know, you give somebody to do a task and he, he keeps asking, how's this? How's this? Uh, it's the task I gave you to do. Do it the way you would do it, you know? So. Are, are there, we've, we've, we certainly are all very positive on it or we wouldn't have had groups help us or kept it going very long. Um, are there, are there, if somebody's looking to, you know, start a group, are there, are there any disadvantages or any things they ought to caution themselves on? I, you know, I'll, I'll say one sort of a disadvantage <laughs> is that if, if you do it yourself on your layout, you will learn it and you will know everything about your layout. 
you'll be able to fix everything. You'll be able to do everything. And, and I know that, and I, I recognize that early on, we're all, you know, building fairly good sized layouts that, you know, if you're going to do it all yourself, it's never going to get done. And I know that there are some things where, you know, where if, if I have to go in and I, I like to think that I could figure out JMRI if I need to, but it's something that I've allowed, you know, other, you know, Ken Cameron to, to do on my layout and, and, uh, you know, so, so I, you know, it's difficult for me to go in and make changes. I'd like to think I could if I needed to, but I would be a, it would be a, a learning curve for me. Um, so, you know, I talked about wiring before, um, you know, or, so that to me is the only real negative at all is, you, you know, you do, you do give up some knowledge of your, of your layout. Um, I don't know if anybody else has anything that to add that's a little bit, you know, to that. Well, I agree with that. Um, I have people who did wiring and did scenery and did track laying with me and, if something goes wrong, I have to convene a group to <laughs> figure it out sometimes. Uh, but um, I, don't, I don't think there are many disadvantages. One of the disadvantages that there is, which is kind of minor, is that you have to plan each work session. You can't just open the door and have everyone come in and be productive. You have to have something planned for them, uh, at least in general terms so that they, they know where to focus their attention on a given night. Now, I, I have a clipboard, uh, you know, with a sheet of paper. And uh, usually after each operating session we have, we if we have a problem on the layout, a section, a track, a dead spot, we'll mark it on that paper. And then at the next work session, um, my, my guys that do, you know, work with track, they'll look at that and they'll get to, work on repairing that piece of track, uh, say with, if we got a, a dead spot, um, my electrician guy, my electrical guy will come in and he'll see that and, and we'll start working on that. So I, we kind of work off of a list of repairs that need to be done. Um, I still have several locations on the, on my layout that needs scenery done. Now I like doing scenery myself, um, but I've got, again, a couple of guys in the group that are, have a more detailed eye than I do for details. And even though I've already I've seen it to spot, they'll come in and even detail it even better. And that's what I like about these guys in my group. I, you know, I think one of the things we've talked around, and, but to talk more specifically is really the, you know, the learning and the educational aspects mm -hmm. of a group, not you know, not just for yourself. I mean, I, you know, I mentioned things like spline roadbed, you know, that I had no idea how to do that or pouring waterfalls and, and, uh, you know, so not only did I learn a lot, but I think the people on my crew learned a lot also, you know, because the, the people that really knew what they were doing were able to explain it to others and really, you know, learn a lot and i think that i think the education um you know along with the socializing along with the productivity you know along with making good progress is really you know a, a key positive aspect of of you know having a group that you can you know just not, not just you everybody can learn and i would say add to that i agree with you but i would add to that that when there a problem does arise you might have three or four people throwing ideas out, well, it could be this, it could be that. Why don't we try this? Why don't we try that? Let's see if this is the problem, if this will fix it. And and sometimes we come up with really poor answers and sometimes it works, so. One, one thing I'm curious about, um, I've heard this on other layouts. I've I've talked to people who have operational layouts that were you know built by groups, and they they you know had some sort of either formal or informal. I'll use the term seniority system, where if you help build the layout, you get your first choice at op sessions and jobs and op mm -hmm. sessions. Do do any of you do anything like that? 
No, I don't have a seniority system. I, I, uh, for my op sessions, I have a, a whiteboard and for the trains that I, I, uh, want to run, I list them up there in a, 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 with a marker and, uh, and when they start showing up, I says, there's the trains. I'm not going to sign them. Pick what you want to do. So I, I don't, I don't do any sort of seniority system like that. So I want it to be fun. I don't want to be bossing it down. <laughs> I want to make sure they come back. <laughs> I worked on the railroad many years and it's on a seniority system and the people with the most seniority got the best assignments. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing on the railroad, but when you're in my basement, I want you to do what you like. You know, mm -hmm. We have not set up an operating system yet. And my plan is not to do it myself, but to go with each member uh, as a group again and say okay this is what i'm thinking what do you guys think about this what do you think if we add this one what do, you know and so it'll be a group effort to come up with an op i uh i don't have a seniority system uh but i'm not operating yet i'm on the verge of doing it i expect to be operating very soon um i don't i don't anticipate having a seniority system I, I don't have one either, but I have talked to people who do, you know, and uh, kind of interesting. And I, I would say for for my obsession, I'm, I'm sure it's the same for, for you. There's a big overlap. The people that helped build the layout were the ones who are most interested in operating it as well. Yes. So they're the ones who, you know, show up regularly and, you know, when they're, you know, to op sessions. Um, so, you know, I didn't really feel the need to do anything like that because it's, you know, there's so much overlap between my, you know, my regulars, as I call them, you know, they, mm -hmm. for the most part, they were the ones who helped build it. How many uh, operating positions do you have on yours? On my layout, I can, I can uh, have about 15 guys for an op session. That's a, that's a full up crew. That's two person crews um, for mainline trains, two people in the yard. Um, so 15, if you count the dispatcher, which is that, that'd be actually 16 people running the layout. Now that's a, that's a very full group. I would say that, uh, you know, about 14 is, you know, now 12, 13 is probably more comfortable. So, so does anybody have any, you know, uh, funny stories or anything that happened during their uh, during their work sessions that they want to share? Well, as a good friend of mine reminded when I told him I was going to be doing this call, I'm trying to think of any thing that might have happened. And he, he reminded me of one one day when one of the one of my group members uh, showed up, we were trying to add add another section of track, I think a modular section to, to built into the permanent layout. And it involved, according to him, it involved in moving one of my, uh, 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 the you know, the pillars that hold up the, the, the center beam of the house in the basement, the, the gray pipes. And he showed up with, with these jacks and, and, and uh, big brackets. And I said, uh, what are you doing with that? He says, oh, I want to jack up the house to relocate <laughs> one of the supports. But it's, no, they're not going to do that. This house was built in the late 1800s for one thing. And, uh, you know, the basement, you know, it had a newer ba basement, you know, uh, poured, you know, a cinder block foundation of floor. But no, 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 no. We're not going to touch the, the, the frame of the house at all. Work around it. So, <laughs> so sometimes never had that you experience. have to speak up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. <laughs> Mark or Joe, you know, the, the, the only story I'll tell wasn't really a group work session, but it was, it was a, a wake up call for me, how uh, different and better my life was going to be when I was retired. And uh, so on my very first day of retirement, I mean, literally my first day it was a Monday, I stopped work on Friday and uh, Bill Brown came over and I, can't remember why he was coming over to drop something off or something, but we were down looking at the layout and and uh, we were looking at for those of you who've been to my layout at the Kettle Falls 
blob, I call it, and the turn back blob. And, uh, and I was telling Bill that, boy, you know, I kind of blew this a little bit. I should have made this blob a little bit bigger and there would have been room to run a nice river scene down along the tracks. And of course, Bill said, well, what are you waiting for? And <laughs> within two hours, we had taken apart the fascia, added to the under, I added to the, you know, the, the bench work, expanded it all out, put in, put, we didn't actually pour the river that day, but we came close to it. And I was like, well, this is going to be nice not having to go to work and can just, you know, at the spur of the moment, change my layout. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So. Well, maybe we should get to the questions now. We have uh, a number of questions that were asked. Oh, okay, good. Um, the first question is, uh, how do you balance the need for help and bodies willing to show up versus keeping your standards? We kind of talked around that, but we didn't really address that. I'll, I'll jump in at the beginning. I, uh, To me, you know, I, I think... I, I don't think that turns out to be as big a problem as we talked about um, because you people tend to gravitate to the jobs that they're good at or if they're not good at a job or they're learning it they'll look to the people that have confidence and know what they're doing so i, I found that to be a rare thing but i i think that it's important to communicate to your work crews um, you know, of what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to build and the kind of a quality that you're trying to do. And, and I think if you communicate to people before there's a problem to let them know that, hey, you know, we're all here to learn. And if, you know, that understand that there is a there is a possibility that you might and I rarely had to do this. Mark mentioned having to do it that you might have to, you know, fix something. You might come back later and find out that something you did has changed. Um, that nobody, you know, that, you know, that that's not a problem and, it, you know, and it could happen. So I, I think that communicating and, and just, and also just, I think the most important thing is just paying attention to the best you can. I know, as Mark said, you run around a lot as a gopher, but if you're paying attention to what people are doing, you can stop them before it gets too far, you know, out of hand. So I think it, I think it's important to kind of keep an eye on what people are doing as well. I have I to say this. I have people that uh, are never satisfied with the quality. <clears throat> They'll say to me, we should go back and recut this piece. I can see a sliver of light or an opening. <laughs> and and this one guy is a Finnish carpenter as a, as a hobby. He builds bookcases and what have you. And he shows up with tools and or brings stuff that he cuts. Uh, and it, it, it's wonderful. I mean, I couldn't do it. it was, so he, he'll push me. And another fellow who's new, one of the guys said, when you need a piece of wood cut, you need Steve to cut it because the guy never deviates from the line. He just does things perfectly. <laughs> so uh, where I might find, say, eh, it's good enough. We'll cover it up. We'll fill it in. You know, that sort right. of thing. Yeah, usually my standards are a little bit lower than their standards. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, well, What else do you have, Mark? Okay. Is everyone in the crew modeling in the same scale? I assume they mean at their own homes. H.O. here. H.O. 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 for me. Except uh, we have people in three. You have some yes, I have three. a narrow gauge too. Yeah. Um, we have people in the in the group that comes over the model in N. And um, I don't think we have anybody modeling in O. Do we have anybody in O scale, Joe? Well, I, I am a member of an O scale club. You're in an O scale club. Yep. So you're doing both. You're, you're modeling an HO and then modeling an O. And I just joined a G scale club. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay. Let's see what else we have here. How do you manage having the materials on hand for the work crew? Home Depot, Lowe's. <laughs> Just keep buying a lot of stuff. I always I mean, say to I say to my crew, if 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 you're going to need something, they say, "Oh, I don't need it now." I say, "What do you need for next week? Are you running low on plaster? Are you running low on this?" And 
and I try to make sure that it's there the following week. Yeah, I, 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 I think a realistic um, issue, if you want to say it, is that if you have a crew, you're going to go through materials and supplies much faster than you would if you were working on your own. Mm -hmm. And that, and yes. your layout might not cost any more money at the end when it's completed than it would have if you did it on your own, but you, you are going to be going through material more rapidly. And I think that is a reality. And I, I know that um, like when I was laying track, you know, again, I, you know, pretty large layout, but you know, I was buying, I wasn't going to the store and buying a few pieces of flex track. I was ordering boxes of flex track. Right. And, right. You yeah. know, and I was buying, you know, you know, 30 turnouts. So it, it, it is something to consider. I mean, it, it definitely is something to consider that you're going to go through material faster, um, and and that has you know financial ramifications because it it is hard to keep a you know a group you know productive if you don't have the materials for them. Several members of my group um, when we were first start first starting the layout, uh, one of my members actually lived in Connecticut, but he was a good friend of mine and. He could come up once in a while, but he felt guilty of not making the work sessions. So we were laying a lot of track at the time. So all of a sudden there's a UPS package outside my door uh, of a whole box of Atlas Flex track that he shipped up to my house to donate for the layout. Nice. Nice friend to have. Yeah, yeah. there's a good friend. Well, I have <laughs> to say that. Um, Mark has donated to my layout, and I think I've donated a few things to your layout. Yes. Somebody will have excess wood or excess whatever, and he'll show up and say, well, I'm not going to use these. Uh, I think it'll fit in your yard. And, and that is absolutely a positive, too, that we haven't mentioned before. There's things on my layout because people were helping me build the layout. They would say, I know just the thing that would go here. And they had something, you know, a structure, you know, bridge or structure or or they volunteered to build a bridge, which, you know, if I had to stop and scratch build a bridge, that would really delay progress. But they were saying, hey, I can scratch build a bridge that'll fit here, you know, where the end of track is right now. Um, yeah. So, you know, they're, they're def definitely, um, you know, that was certainly a positive of things that would have taken me, uh, you know, a long time to do. Well, Jim has uh, Jim has built a hot wire cutter, so I didn't have to purchase one. And he also has designed, we're building the pollen skill viaduct on my layout. It's 12 and a half feet long. Jim did all the engineering drawings. And we look forward to completing that. We just have it roughly outlined now. So it's you get those kinds of things. Okay, here's another question. Uh, two questions, really. How do you make sure the personalities of the crew get along? And have you ever had to politely refuse help? <laughs> Cattle prod. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did say something once to one person uh, who like to poke jabs at other people and i do understand that that can be a fun thing but i i you never know how the new person is taking it so i'd say to him hey listen you know just kind of cool it on on poking jabs at at somebody until you get to know them and if they're willing to accept that that's fine with me but it can get out of hand I've had some, I've had an instance where uh, someone was insisting he knew better than another person that were working on the, on the HO and three track. And uh, he didn't know it, but the person he was criticizing was uh, an expert track layer. He did his own handling of track and there was some friction going on there. And I just made sure not to pair them up the next time. Yeah, I, I never had any, I'm happy to say I never really had any incidents. Sometimes people might have a little bit of a disagreement, nothing where it was, you know, that I saw that was really causing friction, but they're, you know, they're, they're having trouble getting going there because they're disagreeing on the right approach. And so sometimes I've had to kind of step in and say, hey, this is what I want to have done, which mm -hmm. is, you know, which is one of the nice things about, 
you know, we, we haven't really said this, but I think it's a little, I used to say this a lot early on in the first few years I was building my layout, it, that it, it was a little bit like having a club, but not where you could leverage everybody and their skills, but without having any of the politics of the club, because at the end of the day, it was what I wanted, you know, and mm -hmm. for the most part, you know, or my vision, I, I guess I should say. Um, and so there wasn't, you know, so at the end of the day, you could you could say, well, this is this is what I want to have done. Yeah, yeah Jim so. said to me, this is like belonging to a club, but no dues. You pay <laughs> all the bills. <laughs> and I said, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, you know, I'm, it's my project in the end. I'm going to pay for it one way or the other. And um, Right. OK, um, here's another one. Do you go through a vetting process for new members? No. I personally don't. No, I don't. No, I don't. No. No. Uh, do you have I mean, a style? I will say this. I knew everybody. So I, I didn't have any somebody show up new who I didn't know. I always knew them first before I invited yeah. them. Yeah, I had two guys idea. come in I didn't know at all. And they came twice. And then I, I never saw them again. I think that they thought they were going to run the trains, not, <laughs> not actually, worse. you know, do the construction part of it. And I had them. Uh, laying track, which was a mistake because it was the skill level wasn't that. But you know, I did. I didn't vet them, and I, and if they wanted to come back, I'd be more than happy to have them. I think when you have a large layout and a lot of tasks to do at the at the beginning and the middle of the construction, there's something for everybody. I think as the as the layout becomes more complete, and you have fewer tasks, then you have to be more selective about who you assign to a certain thing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know my group kind of got smaller as time went on and because of the tasks that were available. I mean, you know, you can have 10 guys building branch work and a lot of guys laying track in different areas, but there gets to be a point where it gets to be harder to really have, a, you know, to be productive at all, keep yeah. people happy. We have three minutes to go before we have to change over to the next program. Uh, let me just select from the number of uh, questions we have left here. Okay. Um, one of the more amusing ones I thought is uh, this one. How do you get someone to volunteer to ballast your track? <laughs> Funny you should ask. I have one fellow who just really enjoys it. I mean, I I did it. I when I first started, I worked with one guy, and he said, "Practice on mine." Then when you do yours, you'll know what you're doing. And I did that. And then these other guy came. He says, "I I like doing it." I'll he he didn't have to be prompted to do it. So. I, I like to ballast, but I I never had any trouble. People would you know if I said, "Hey, we're ballasting today," they would ballast. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Same thing when I'm at one of one of the gentlemen in my group is great at ballasting, and I, I save it all for him. <laughs> so. That's good. Most of the people I know find it too tedious to enjoy. Okay, here's another one. How do you convey your vision to the crew? Do you have to park your ego? <laughs> I think you can't have an ego. You have to, you have to say. Uh, I'm giving you this task, however you do it, mm -hmm. it's fine. I know when Mark uh, tasked me with putting in the, the river on his layout, I kept saying to him, is this what you want? Is this what you want? Because I had never done that before. And um, I think it looks pretty good. Uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you that it's as good as every other river, but, yeah. and he seemed pleased with it. So No, know. I think it's fine. <laughs> Yeah, there, there was no task back when I was having groups, there was no task that we were ever doing that I can think of that I felt that I knew more than somebody else, that there was always somebody in the group who knew more and was better at it than I was. Okay, I think we're at the end of our time. I want to thank everybody for participating in this uh, roundtable. I hope the audience has enjoyed it as much as I have. <clears throat> Uh, we're going to go on to our next uh, part of the program. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mark. All right, bye. Thank now. you. Okay. Um, I 
guess we have time for one more question. Okay, I can introduce the next video here. Our next presenter um, has recently designed a, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Our next presenter uh, is, uh, has a layout. Uh, his name is Doug Diederich. He's uh, gonna present for us the Great Northern Kalispell Division. Um, Speed, can we roll the video? Good evening and welcome to the Great Northern Kalispell Division. I'm your host, Doug Diedrich. And I think the last time we were here was back in 2020. Um, you can check out that video uh, on day three, part two, I believe. Done quite a bit uh, for the last three years, mostly scenery uh, on the layout. So um, the last time we kind of did the video with running a train and going through some of the uh, towns and stuff. Um, I'm going to do this one a little bit different and kind of give you uh, the layout from an operating aspect. Right now I'm standing in Whitefish, Montana. Uh, this represents the westernmost part of the layout um, that you can actually see. I do have a staging yard that sits behind me that represents Seattle. So we'll start here in Whitefish and we're going to move east toward uh, Chicago. Um, so I model from Whitefish, Montana to Shelby, Montana. At Whitefish, during the 1950s, there was an ice facility, which is represented here on the layout. There is also an engine facility with a turntable and a roundhouse. Um, again, these facilities are still there today. The roundhouse back in the 50s was actually quite larger than what you're looking at here, but we had to kind of do some compression. In Whitefish Yard, there are two uh, switching crews. One that works the east end of the yard, which you are looking at here and the other crew would work the west end of the yard. In this view, we can see two bridges. The closest bridge uh, is for the two main lines that run east and west. The bridge located further back is off of the branch line that goes to Kalispell. Um, you can see off to our left is a small little mine that is again served from the Kalispell branch. Heading east, we now come up the branch to Kalispell, as we can see the Kalispell local.
Kalispell, there are 13 industries that serve the local community. The switcher will be busy for most of the day. by the Columbia Falls Station along with the small little town of Columbia Falls just on the outskirts actually um, that has a few industries as well. There is another local that will come up and switch the lumber mill and this small little community. So there are two locals that I run, the Kalispell local and the Columbia Falls. Our next stop will be Belton. This is the Empire Builder, train number 32, heading into Belton. at Belton Station. This is the west entrance to Glacier National Park. Notice the foreign sleeper cars that are parked here. These are cars that were set out by the Western Star during the summer season. They were set out both here at Belton and at Glacier Park. Here we have the Empire Builder leaving Belton Station, heading along the Flathead River. This is the gravel yard that sits outside of Essex, Montana. The gravel yard is used for ballast to ballast the main in both directions. During the summer months, there are up to 60 cars that come in and out per day. Those of you that might have been here in 2020, um, this portion of the layout was unscenic. It has now been completed all the way along the peninsula.
Glacier Park is our next stop for the Empire Building. After leaving Glacier Park, the Empire Builder heads east over to Medicine Creek Bridge. And now we're going to have the drawing for the four $50 gift certificates from Mini Prints and Interaction Hobbies. Chuck Diljack and Bernard Helen from Mini Prints uh, are going to do that next. All right. Well, good evening and welcome to the 2024 NERX drawing. First off, our apologies for RSVP if I shutting down the drawing. We will be working on that issue for the next year's NERX so that does not reoccur. But like last year, the drawing is sponsored by Mini Prints and Interaction Hobbies. Both are contributing two $50 gift cards to the drawing. Hello, my name is Chuck Diljack of the Garden State Division, and I will be hosting this segment of the NERX program. With me in the booth is Bernard Helen, and obviously Mark as our host. Uh, and I, unfortunately, Daryl Jacobs from Interaction Hobbies is unable to join us this evening. However, I want to say a few words about Interaction Hobbies. They're dedicated to supplying high quality, unique kits and components in multiple scales. Interaction Hobbies uses the best materials they can find for their kits. While they do use injection molded window and doors from time to time, they will mainly laser cut and 3D engrave their own to closely match the prototype they are modeling. Interaction Hobbies believes it is important to go the extra mile to model the prototype as accurately as they can to represent and preserve history in miniature. 
Bernard, can you introduce yourself? Hey, thanks, Chuck. It's uh, an honor to be here for the fourth year in a row. We're really pleased. I'm really pleased uh, to support NERX. And the last four days have been amazing. It's been so much fun to watch it and such great content. And I've really enjoyed it. So thank you for having me back again. Um, I'm a model railroader. I model uh, the Genesee and Wyoming short line, Quebec Gatineau from Montreal to Quebec City in HO scale in my basement. And as I'm sure you and a lot of other people know, uh, four years ago, because I needed a little 3D printed part, I ended up starting my own 3D printing business. And I guess I went from a modeler to a, re a reluctant manufacturer. And now miniprints.com is my full-time business. So I make many things, many, many things. And I've been known to shrink things and people. So uh, having a lot of fun and thrilled to support NERX again. Well, thank you, Bernard. Well, now I guess it's time for the drawing. And Bernard, you have a little tool, I believe, that we yeah. can Yeah. Well, through the power of the interweb, I found this spinny thing. Should we give it a spin and see if it works? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't well, remember. Let's... Last year, I think we just picked random numbers. But this year, we're, we're, we're going to kick it up a notch, and we'll see if it works. That sounds good. That sounds All right. Great. So I'm going to share. What we'll do is the first, the first winner will be a mini prints winner, and then we'll alternate to interaction hobbies after that, then mini prints, and then interaction hobbies. Excellent. And this will be a fifty dollars. So the first one will be a fifty dollar U.S. credit at mini prints dot com, and uh, I will share my screen now. And if this works, you will see a wheel, and there are seventy eight entries to the contest. So shall I give it a spin and we'll see who our first winner of the $50 miniprints.com gift card is? Absolutely. All right. So this will correspond to a number that you have on a spreadsheet and we're spinning. The anticipation. I love the sound. It feels very Vegas. Oh. Number 48. 48. And so who's that? 48 is Tom Oxnard. Oh, Excellent. Wow. Congratulations, Tom. Tom gets $50 US at miniprints.com. All right. Well, I guess the next spin is for an interaction hobbies $50 US dollar credit. Okay. So let's give it another spin. Let's try this again. All right, ready to go. Here we go. Oh, this is fun. We could do this all night. Oh, I, I like the sound. This is great. <laughs> all right, lucky 27. All right, this is Robert Demkowitz. Congratulations, so he wins an Interaction Robert. Hobbies gift certificate for fifty dollars. Congratulations. This is this. Oh. I, I want to do more than four. All right, well, well that's up to you. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Good answer. Uh, so this is back for the fifty dollars credit at miniprints.com. We will spin yes. again. And round we go. Oh, 71. 71. So who's the lucky winner there? That's Barry Olson. Okay. Congratulations. Congratulations, Barry. And our last drawing for an our last hobbies, spin of the wheel. All right. Let's see. Do you want to spin it or shall I? Oh, uh, you go ahead. All right. That the wear out your arm. Oh, oh one. what are the odds? One. This Bill Stimson. Bill Stimson, the all right. Final winner. I feel winners. like I feel like we did that in record time this year. Oh, I know, I know. Maybe it was too efficient. Well, maybe I will. We get, maybe, maybe we need some Rube Goldberg uh, apparatus that for next year. We we've set the bar for next year. We'll 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 definitely achieve better. Um, I will say that if you didn't win one of the fifty dollar gift cards, uh, you can still win at miniprints.com uh, because I've just started a new promotion that'll run for the next week. Uh, that everybody who spends fifty dollars U.S. or more will get free shipping anywhere in the world. So throughout the U.S. and 
if you have a cousin in Timbuktu and you'd like to send them something, free shipping to the U.S. and around the world uh, for orders over $50 with the code MADNESS. It's our March Madness offer. So just type MADNESS in the coupon code box uh, and you will get free shipping and then everybody wins. All right. Well, thank you. And, and thank I you. I would like to thank Daryl and Bernard on behalf of the NERX and NMRX, NMRAX teams for being our sponsors this year. And congratulations to the winners. And let's continue with this evening's program. So back to you, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Chuck. <clears throat> our next presenter has been a model railroader since he was a teenager. He was a member of the Northwestern Vermont Model Railroad Association in high school and college and joined the NMRA during college. He started attending the Hub Division activities in 1995. He served two terms as the NER Massachusetts Director and two terms on the Hub Board of Directors, and has served as the NER Photo Contest Chairman and on the NER Audit Committee. He has edited the Hub Division's The Headlight since 2011. He has also created the handbooks for two past NER conventions. He has been with a small structural engineering firm based in Needham, Massachusetts since he finished his master's degree in 1995. The firm specializes in the design of all types of buildings. So let's welcome Bill Barry, who's gonna talk on the design and construction of prototype buildings for model railroaders. Welcome. Speed, you this is the clinic regarding the design and construction of prototype buildings for model railroaders presented for the, at the NERX March 2024 uh, online convention. This clinic is an introduction to the structural aspects of buildings with the intent of educating model railroaders about structure to assist in the construction of accurate and period specific model buildings. Uh, detailed knowledge of the prototype uh, and their history in the history could aid the modeler in producing more realistic buildings, either scratch built or kit bashed. I have worked for a small structural engineering firm since 1995, and I'm a registered professional engineer in the state of Massachusetts. I'm involved in all aspects of the building engineering process. We will cover three primary topics today during this presentation, including some structural engineering concepts, but there won't be a quiz. Uh, things that will discuss primary building components for buildings and the materials used in buildings and their history. So here's the uh, kind of a definition of structural engineering, which is the analysis and design of structures constructed of various materials to safely and effectively resist the applied forces. Analysis is the abstract part of the process involves mathematical calculations of the forces and deformations of a building. An analysis is done by hand, which is why I've got a calculator shown or we use a lot of computational tools today. Uh, design is more the process of actually selecting the appropriate elements for constructing the building. It's actually a kind of a science and an art. So there's uh, decisions that are made uh, that are not purely based on the structural analysis. So let's go through some of these. So here's a compression is the, the pushing forces applied to an element. And columns and posts in buildings are an example of this, although my an animation is sideways. Another thing that something that happens with compression members is that based on their length or shape, they can buckle and uh, buckling is a sudden failure. So we try to engineer so that it does not occur um, since that would be not good. So we will use a shorter stockier member to avoid that. Tension members is obviously the, uh, let's see, let's see is the pulling a part of a structural, a building element. So hangers, are an example of this if you're hanging something inside a building. Bending is the force applied to a building element that bends it out of shape. Uh, beams and girders are building elements that experience this phenomenon. The other uh, characteristic of beams uh, of bending is that the top of the beam is in compression and the bottom is in tension. Uh, conveniently, usually we build, uh, we put beams with building either decking or slabs on top that brace the beam so the buckling of the top flange does not happen. Another phenomenon related to the bending members is called stiff stiffness. So for the same spans, a deeper element will deflect less under loading and uh, more flexibility, i.e. 
more, less stiffness can be perceived more by per people. So we want to minimize that. And also you have differential movement between different parts of a building. So you try to maintain the same stiffness between different elements. Finally, we have shear forces. And this is the trying to uh, slide one part relative to another. Think of a pair of scissors, which are also known as shears. So that's you're shearing the paper. So uh, buildings undergo have are, are subjected to various types of loading. So we have dead load, which is the weight of the structure, and then any permanent equipment or furnishings. Live loads, which is the occupants or say vehicles or other variable loads, such as snow loads. Wind loads are, are the is caused by the is the pressure on the building caused by the wind or pressure and suction, and it varies with the uh, height above the ground. And so you have higher pressures, the higher up uh, in the air you go. And then we have seismic or earthquake loads. And from an engineering point of view, this is this is related to the ground moving. So the building wants to stay in one place as the ground moves, and that causes a force on the building. And earthquake loads are variable and, and will depend on where your location. If you're on soft soils, those are going to actually amplify earthquake loads. So someplace like Mexico City has higher earthquake loads than someplace actually on hard rock, you actually do better. Thermal loads are related to the temperature cycling, like the sides of a building during the day, it's gonna be subjected to different um, sun exposure during certain points and others in the temperature. And those can cause forces within building materials. Finally, you've got impact loads, when cars running into buildings, for example. So the primary building components we're gonna go through are our foundations, walls, columns and posts, floors, roofs, and lateral systems. So foundations um, are, are directly, so these are hold up the building and you have two types of foundations. We have non-structural or shallow foundations and then structural or deep foundations. So shallow foundations are typically constructed right on the ground or rock and they, they use a combination of things. It's called, we start with footings typically and then we have foundation walls. And these were built with different materials through time. So originally you would have used stone and those would have been used um, into the 1900s. And then they used a lot of brick foundations until say the 50s. Now, and then concrete block was used as the 1900s to present and same thing with concrete. A lot of most foundations are done with concrete today. Structural foundations have deep elements that are pushed, either pushed or drilled or constructed deep into the ground to transfer the the building weight down to a more competent material. And uh, typically you'll have deep elements, which are either pile, can be called piles, which can be made out of wood, steel, or concrete, or you can have caissons or drilled piers used to be hand dug. The weight from the building above, which is carried by beams instead of walls. So that's the difference there. So buildings have walls. You can have uh, bearing walls that carry the weight of the building, such as the brick walls in the, the left image. And you also have interior partitions that will separate up a space. And uh, they may be structural or they may not be like these walls. Some of these walls are not non-bearing, so they don't carry the weight of the building because the, the framework above. Here's an example of another non-structural non wall in some ways, but it's keeping the elements out. So the glass is supported on the framework of the building. So it doesn't transfer the weight of the building, but it keeps the wind, it resists the wind loads that act on the building and obviously keeps the weather out. Here's an example of a more modern building that I designed a number of years ago that uses a variety of wall types and materials uh, to encase the building. We have both um, the, what looks like brick walls are actually thin brick on metal wall panels that are in a, made in a factory. We have aluminum curtain wall system. The garage was encased with concrete block that was attached back to the steel framework of the building. Yeah, also floors. So this is the, the obviously provides support for the occupants and the contents. Um, and then floors that aren't the same size as the, the whole building would be called mezzanines or lofts. And these are floors are usually constructed with decking or slabs supported by the beams and girders. So floor materials coverings vary. Here's a mill where we have some wood flooring on top of timber decking. 
cover that when we get to mill buildings as well. Of course, roofs protect the building from the elements. And you can have two types of roofs. You can have flat roofs or what we call flat, but it's actually sloped slightly, which you see in several of these buildings. And pitched roofs that shed the snow and water rain more directly like the house over to the left. And, um, and roof coverings will depend on the type of roof as well. You see that some of these shallower slope roofs have tar and gravel or a roof membrane, whereas you'll see shingles or or slate on a steeper roof or the metal, excuse me, there's some metal siding, metal roofing shown there. And then related to roofs, you've got lots of material or items that are installed on the roof, uh, such as the, the um, skylights, chimneys, satellite dishes, rooftop equipment. There is another uh, presentation about this um, that will be happening. Uh, so let's move on to posts and columns. So these carry the weight of the building down and they allow for an open area because you don't have walls. So, and they can be done, use two types. This is an example. We have a timber post on the left and a steel column. And finally, the lateral system is the elements that resist the horizontal loads, the wind and the earthquake loads. And we call it a system because you need several different elements of the building combined to provide the lateral system. Older buildings didn't have a particular system. It was just there were walls generally provided that walls and floors and the roof generally provided that, but they weren't engineered. For example, today we we have to provide an engineered system to resist this. And in older buildings where we may come back and retrofit, uh, we'll add a system like the picture shows where we've added steel brace frames to this older concrete building that did not meet code. So we've upgraded it uh, for its use. So now we'll go into construction materials, and those those include four shown masonry, wood, concrete, iron, and steel. So masonry is the uh, one of the oldest construction materials, and it's uh, well, of course, got the definitions here for you. The work of a mason, and it's it's composed of generally small units of brick, stone, or tile that are bonded together typically with mortar, although you can find, if you have dry laid stone walls uh, are very common as well. So it doesn't have to be mortared together. The uh, masonry can provide strength, weather protection, security, fire resistance, and sound resistance. So we'll start with stone masonry. As I said, the, you had dry laid rubble walls were used, for example, at the bottom of this building below ground to the foundation wall would have been dry laid stone. And then they used a mortared stone above that. The um, cut stones, yeah, cut stones were used for the exposed portion. And then mortared stone is still in use today, although we typically will use a different, it's called thin veneer over a backup material. So we'll typically try to find another way to do it. For openings in stonework, yeah, we covered it. And we're going to cover that. We have stone lintels at the uh, flat windows up top, and then you have arches that will transfer the the weight using the masonry itself to transfer the weight of the wall around the opening. Another masonry type is brick masonry, and brick is is uh, created by burning clay, which gives it hardness and durability. Uh, brick which is, was brickwork was originally produced on the construction site, was but was industrialized pretty early. So it was it was common to find a brick plant in every town. And by the 1800s, uh, mechanized extrusions and kilns were invented so that the quality and uniformity was improved. And that facilitated the, you know, the sped up the drying process and standardized brick sizes um, occur, started being used in 1883. And the modular sizes we use today uh, were, were incorporated in 1946. So this building, I believe, is older than that. But one of the the um, handy things is the standard shapes of bricks. Okay. And so this this is an example of a facade in Boston. We have um, different types of lintels and sills that are incorporated into the brickwork, and different types of arches. So I wanted to show that where they've used segmental arches and semicircular arches to create the openings. This is another example of brick as well that shows some weathering and stuff on an existing building. So um, 
So for from 1800s until the 1900s, brick was used for bearing walls, which this building is, is, is composed of. And you can see on every six course, they had a brick that was turned and that would combine the, the various what are called whites or layers of brick together. So that's what you'll find on a bearing wall type structure. And then this one is older. So after a while, they went to what's called running bond where they stack the brick consistently and you don't see the, it's called a header course. And then arches, this is again, we have concrete lintel or we have stone. Also have sills of different materials. You can see where they repaired the opening on the left. They changed what they're using. And um, so, and then because walls are built with various uh, layers, the building codes eventually standardized and provided a chart for working out how thick your walls had to be. This is an example from the Boston Building Code that shows how the taller the building, the thicker the walls had to be at the bottom of the building. So that varied up to a 20 inches thick for an eight story building. So it takes up a lot of space. And then uh, because brick was uh, labor intensive, eventually they started using it more as a facing on, a, on another type of building. So this, this building from a project I did, that's just a thin veneer that's being constructed and it's anchored back with metal ties. Although on this one, the architect wanted it to look like an older wall. So they've actually cut the bricks every six courses to create a header course. Um, and then uh, modern brick is nominally uh, four by eight inches, and then every eight inches vertically is three courses. So you can you can use those when you're looking at photos to try to estimate the size of a, a building. It does come in handy because they were made standard. And this is these are um, masonry arch floors. So this was a way to get a non-combustible floor system with our with steel or iron beams. So you can see the beams are the stripes at the bottom of the arch. So then the floor is constructed with the arching of the masonry between the steel, the, uh, the beams. And uh, eventually they did also come up with the clay tile systems that worked around this kind of a kit of parts that you could build your arch floor. But I have no photos of brick. And I uh, want to get into concrete block. Now this was developed uh, right around the turn of the 90s. So it started in 1897 and then um, so the rock face, which is that sample I show there, that was available from about 1900 to 1930 because it did look like stone. So they were trying to come up with something that didn't look like modern concrete block. And they were also in the, the original concrete block was much bigger than what we use today. Today, a standard block like the photo on the left, those are eight inches by six, eight inches tall and eight inches thick typically, and they're 16 inches long. So again, you can use that knowledge to measure a building. You can also find where they today they'll they'll take block and they'll split it to make a rough texture, but they don't do the form. They they actually break the block after it's cast, and then re reinforced concrete masonry where we have rebar into the voids within the block is the most common form of structural masonry used today. So next we move on to wood, one of the oldest construction materials, and it's of course widely available and renewable. The, uh, you can construct pretty much all different elements of a building as loaded there. I've got everything listed, so you can uh, pretty much make anything with wood. And of course, most light light frame structures in North America are actually made out of wood. And it's also used in many institutional and industrial buildings uh, for various reasons, and obviously different eras. So a lot more common. So the earliest buildings would have been log cabins. So this is an example or log type structures, I should say. So and that eventually evolved into timber framing. So here's an example of a barn. So one of the things this would have, the timber frame would have used typical traditional joinery methods. You can see this has mortise and tenon, lead in members, and the, the pieces were fairly large and, and spaced far apart, except for the, in this case, the roof. So that's what that would use. And the joinery, they eventually went on to different materials uh, for connections, but more timber uh, connections. And then we have light frame wood framing is the most common uh, type of framing we see today. And that has actually evolved as well. In the uh, originally when the trees, tall trees were available, they would run very tall studs and the platform framing uh, system, which is shown on the right was utilized. And that was introduced about 1830 and it spread across the country, it was in use all across the country by 1870. So the studs would go all the way from the foundation to the roof, and then the joists would be supported off of what's called a lead-in um, ribbon strip. 
the disadvantage is that fire can travel up that space in the wall. So in the, um, sorry, platform framing was developed about 1910, and that's where we, shorter studs are used and the joist stack on top. And it also creates a better connection with the floor. And so it actually was started out on the West Coast as it was more sturdy and then it spread across the country and is now how we still frame wood frame buildings traditionally today. Another type of wood frame construction is a combination. It's, it was combines uh, heavy timber with, with masonry walls. And so it was designed for industrial applications and it, it you, yeah, sorry. <laughs> And it utilizes the heavy masonry to create a fireproof exterior to the building, whereas the floors are typically constructed of, of timber framing. So you'll find that it has longer spans because of the larger timber framing members. And they do use specialized details sometimes, which I'll show you, and the masonry bearing walls. And there were typically piers in line with the beams. And um, the heavy timbers were spaced, say, 8 to 11 feet and span about 16 to 25 feet. And we had the timber cast iron columns. We'll talk about that. And then standard designs were developed actually by the insurance companies and then adopted by the 1800s, 1880s. And they were used, standard designs were utilized until the end of World War II. So this is an example of the inside of a mill. You can see we've got the repetitive timber beams that then pocket into the wall for support. The exterior wall, they'll use either in this case, timber columns, or posts with uh, cast iron capitals. And then you have a repetitive window pattern. This is an exterior view, and you can see the piers or pilasters, as we call it, between each set of windows. And that's where the beams are framing into the wall. So in the case of the mill on the left, they actually made these piers get bigger on the outside of the building. So the inside is full, all the floors are the same on the inside, which has its benefit for leasable space, but it takes up the outside. And then the, the mill on the right side has uh, piers that get bigger on the inside of the building and they just, they're all the same plane on the outside. So. Then another detail common with mills is you'll have a cast iron assembly to hold up the beams. In this case, they've got timber posts coming down and you don't wanna crush because you have the multiple floors of weight, you don't wanna crush wood perpendicular to the grain as it will crush. So they had a detail where the posts from above will anchor down to the column below. And then the other choice on a, sometimes on cast iron columns, they have what's called a pintle, which is a cast iron assembly, assembly that's hidden by the beam, but it transfers the load around the timber beams. So this is one of the ways it works because you're not putting all of the weight on the beams, you're carrying it directly and, and wood is very strong uh, parallel to the grain the uh, wood framing. So we get into some of the typical things about light wood framing. So floor and, and wall sheathing um, used diagonal boards until about 1945. Uh, plywood was being developed um, in the West Coast originally and then spread across the country about 1945. And that's why we then see plywood um, used uh, nationwide. And then in the 80s, the alternative of or oriented strand board, which uses smaller chips of wood so it's a uh, more economical or um, uses a lot of waste. So it's more, um, I guess, environmentally friendly. Not everybody's a fan. And, um, and then mill lumber. So originally in buildings, they would just cut the, cut the lumber on the sawmill and they just would use it and it would come in various sizes and it was not consistent. So then they started milling the lumber in the forties and then eventually they came up with what's called nominal sizes. And those of those, they originally milled off or planed off a certain amount and they started out. So a two by four was a little bit less than two inches by four inches. But by the seventies, the sizes we have today where it's an inch and a half by three and a half have been standardized. And we still use that size today. Engineered lumber products were utilized. These use typically use glue combined with uh, smaller pieces of wood to create things like a glue lamb beam, there's also, um, that was started, those were in the 30s. We also have LVL beams, which are produced in a similar way to plywood. And those were first introduced in the 70s. And then in the 80s, they came out with what's called parallel strand lumber. And that has smaller strips of wood that are glued together. Um, so they're very efficient use of the waste materials that would have otherwise gotten thrown away. 
Um, I don't show it here, but the eye joists are another type of engineered wood product, and that's those were introduced in 1969. They have dimensional or LVL flanges with a thin web of plywood or OSB. Uh, trusses for wood frame in the uh, timber trusses uh, originally used heavy timber and they were notched together. As you can see, the diagonals here notch in, so they use some joinery methods and they also tended to use um, wrought iron or steel tension rods in combination. And these would be spaced um, fairly far apart, so they might be ten, uh, 12 to 20 feet apart, and then the purlins would span between them. So there would be less of these trusses. So, and then that was, those were used, say, into the early 1900s. They're pretty common from the 1800s. And then eventually we, the, oh, and this is a modern version of a timber truss that I designed using steel connector plates with bolts instead of joinery methods. But the, the concept's the same. And then these are the more commonly used material we use on a lot of projects today is lightweight trusses. So these were these are typically spaced 12 to 24 inches on center. And they were originally they were designed by bolting together small, you know, bits of two by fours, two by sixes, whatever, but you would bolt them together. And then in the uh, 50s, they came up with the metal connector plate, which has a they fold you fold little points through the steel sheet and it creates these little kind of nailer plates that are pressed into the wood. So that started in 52 and then they standardized um, systems by the 60s. And then another use of that was in the 70s. We have the the four by two, I call it floor truss you see in the lower lower right photo. So those are again parallel cord four by two trusses. They were introduced in the 70s. Now we move on to concrete, which is, of course, a co combination of water, cement, and aggregate. And you have Portland cement that was uh, first created in 1824, and then the uh, concrete was first used in 1844. Now, since concrete is very strong in compression, it's very handy for those purposes, but it's weak in tension. So by pairing it up with steel, which is very good in tension, you uh, create reinforced concrete. And those were first used in the 1800s here. Now, one of the things was because it was a new a new thing. It was developed. The people that were inventing it were creating um, what's called proprietary systems of ways to reinforce the concrete. And they also had proprietary rebar shapes. So or there's a variety of rebar in older buildings, uh, kind of different things that were tried. And then. And then about the 19, you know, 1910s, they started standardizing. 1910, they standardized the design systems. In 1911, they actually standardized the various types of rebar as well. So we've got uh, concrete floors come in two types. There's one-way concrete or two-way concrete floors. And in this case, that means that the loads are transferred by beam action in one, one way in this, this system here. So the ribs of the slab transfer the load to the beams that are supporting it, or you can, can also have support by walls. And um, so that's one way system. And then a two way concrete system, the loads are spread in both directions. So you will typically find those supported by columns such as this example with the, uh, and then because of the loads are coming in and gets, and they used pretty heavy elements, they would thicken the concrete at the supports in this case. So the slab is flat, and you can see the age of this, it's formed with boards. Um, and this happens to be the same building I showed you earlier where we added brace frames, because you can see that beyond. And the tapering capital is part of the concrete column, again, helping get the weight of the heavy concrete system into the columns. This is a different type of two-way system. This is called a waffle slab or a two-way rib slab. So by creating voids in the slab, you can make it lighter, but it's deeper, so it's, it's, it ends up stronger. And then around the column where there's more weight being transferred, they would just fill, not, not make the voids there in the slab. Another, another type of concrete element, or well, some of the different ones we're going to talk about. So post-tensioning um, is utilized where high-strength high wire is run through the concrete. And so that was done to uh, compress the concrete. Since it's good in compression, if you can compress the concrete, it works better. So post-tensioning allows you to make thinner and lighter structures versus regular reinforcement, and you can do longer spans. Uh, Post-tensioning was first developed in the 1930s, and it was first used in buildings in the 1950s. 
and then it became pretty common in buildings in the 60s here um, and used to this day. So precast concrete of which this, this diagram shows a couple of types, those were made in a factory and they, they purposely, they, stra they stress the wires first and they cast the concrete around it. And once it's cured, they then cut that loose. So they would run the wires in a long casting bed and that's how they would create these two types of things. You can also get um, single T's, you can make walls, you can make beams, columns. So precast, pre-stressed is pretty handy for, and it's combined together, uh, more like a steel building, you fasten things with bolts and connectors. And that moves us on to the next material. <laughs> so iron and steel. So we have a variety of iron and steel. You can have cast iron, wrought iron, uh, structural steel. You can also form it into steel joists or use it in prefab metal buildings or pre-engineered metal buildings. So, so cast iron is high in compressive strength, but it's very brittle. So it was initially used for columns starting way back in the uh, 1700s, and it was used into the early 1900s. And columns are usually, well, I'll have a picture, but they're usually hollow and they would, they're lightweight and they would have an integral cap. Um, cover that on the next slide. And cast iron columns were actually used a lot with a timber frame type building as we have around the room. Wrought iron is um, is made by repeated flattening of the, the, the iron to get rid of the impurities and create layers of the slag so that the rest of the iron is strong. So it has more tensile strength and it was originally used for I-shaped beams in the 1850 to 1885. So they would create these smaller beams using wrought iron. And it's obviously, it was used with cast iron columns. So you combine the, the two types of materials. Here's an example of cast iron columns that are used. We have a, they're typically hollow. And in the case of the left one, they've cast that with a flared cap to support the timber beam. And of course, since it's a cast item, you can make it very decorative as is shown in the column on the, on the right. And you'll see that in downtown Boston, you can find entire facades made of, of cast iron. Um, because you can do this nice decorative work that architects like to do. Uh, steel is, of course, so the stronger than those other two elements, and it was first made possible by the Bessemer converter in 1856, and then the Siemens open hearth process. So the idea was these were ways to get rid of the impurities from the iron, and so that you get and you get, get you get a much stronger uh, durable product. And uh, the, Steel was first used um, for buildings starting in the late 1800s, and the first steel frame building was built in 1889. Now, some of the shapes were small, and so the initially when they were forming these uh, steel elements, they made they were pretty small, so they developed ways to tie them together, which is the latticed column you see in the diagram, or you had plates that went across. So for a larger building, you would have to combine plates and smaller angles in this case, or channels. So those were what was available, but but up to the, um, in the late 1800s, they only had beams that were say 15 inches deep. So, and then eventually they, over time, by the 1900s, they could do 24 inch beams. By 1927, they could get 36 inch deep. So the technology improved and the rolling of the steel shapes um, improved. So. What you see with the lattice column, those would have been used until about the 30s. And then you also saw these pipe columns, which are, are known as lally columns. These were typically concrete filled. Those were very common. Uh, it was invented in the 1890s and they were pretty common until the 1960s. Today, we tend to use the, the hollow shapes without any concrete in them. There's that. And then uh, another way to make a larger beam, so you could hot roll the beams I was talking about, or in this case, this is a plate girder, which you rarely see in a building, where they've riveted together the smaller elements to make a steel beam that's, or plate girder in this case. So I just thought it was cool that it was exposed to view. All right, here's a steel truss that was an older steel truss, and I know that because it's riveted. So the techniques for, con for connecting steel elements uh, evolved over time. Initially, they used rivets because bolts were really a low strength item and they didn't do well. So the rivet was really the way to go because it was because you created it to tie the steel material together with the, the uh, what do you want to call it? The hot tube of steel that was compressed by the workman and it tied the material together really well. You can 
see this another shot of the same truss that's using a bolts and you can see the square nuts and that's the giveaway that those are older low strength um, bolts because today we use a, a hex nut on our heavy bolts uh, for structural steel and that's all replaced uh, rivets unless you're doing uh, repair work and rivets uh, bolts yeah they were common in the 30s but they were low strength and then in the 50s is when we we got the high strength bolts that we still use to this day another material made out of steel or element is steel joists and so these were made up of smaller components to make a strong deep um, kind of a truss type system and they were first introduced in the 20s and they were standardized by 1929 and they initially were short maybe 8 to 16 inches but by the by the 50s the industry standard standardized on two different types of joists uh, long span and short span so you could have joists that were 8 to 30 inches of one type and they might span oh, I didn't give spans and then they had deeper ones that went up to 18 to 48 inches deep so you could do span a gymnasium for example with steel joists so these are various types and then the industry is somewhat standard now so you can purchase them from various manufacturers finally we have okay we have floor systems these were so typically on top of steel joists or steel beams you might have seen uh, wood decks or plywood used with steel joists but then eventually they went to concrete slabs and in the 50s they used uh, for the 20s to the 50s they used the expanded wire lath that's in one photo you would drape that across the joists and place the concrete and then in the 50s, they came up with the method where they combine the mesh with the paper so you don't have so much concrete waste. And then finally, the corrugation industry in the, the 60s got really good and they started making these corrugated metal decks that we still use to this day. So those are very interesting. Another type of structural element we want to go over is we composite construction. So this is combining the benefits of the concrete with steel. In this case, the the steel stud that was invented in the in the 50s is welded to the top of the steel beam. You really can't see the steel beam, but that that area, that stretch of beam is exposed there and the studs are attached to it. And those will interlock the concrete to the top of the steel beams below. And that creates, takes the benefits of both worlds of the tension capacity of the steel with the concrete and it makes a very efficient building. We do a lot of these today. And you also reinforce the slab with welded wire mesh, which is a little mini wires that pre-welded together instead of doing individual rebar. And um, so the slabs and then the span, the other benefit of this system is we can put our beams further together, further apart. Steel joists for a floor system will typically be two to two and a half feet apart or on center, but a composite construction, we can go six feet up to 15 feet, depending on how deep the steel decking is. Another use of steel buildings is prefabricated metal buildings. These started out in 1909 as Model T garages, actually. And then standard factory designs were in the 19 teens, they started selling standard designs. And uh, World War II, you saw things like Quonset huts, for examples of more prefabricated metal buildings. And the, the industry tip, uh, kind of standardized in the you know, late 40s and 50s, they came up with these tapered steel girders that I'm showing in that diagram with the rigid frame. And then by the 60s, they introduced the metal metal panels on the outside and what they call Z-purlins that span between the, the rigid frames. They kind of have a diagram of a typical metal building construction. Over time, they changed from prefabricated to pre-engineered. And now with computers, they don't pre-engineer it. They, you, you, when you order a building, they engineer it right then. And that, these are some, I won't. If anybody wants these, these are some of my references that I was used to prepare this presentation. So if you do want a copy of these, you can, you can get that to you. And these are some figures, just because I want to give proper reference. And finally, and that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Bill. That was a very interesting clinic. Uh, it certainly far exceeds my understanding of uh, how buildings are, are made, and uh, I've learned a lot from it. Um, let me go on to some of the questions that we received here. Um, okay. What aspects of this topic are most relevant to model railroaders interested in building structures, in your opinion? 
Um, sort of the intent was to to have it so that you understood like the how the uh, structural work evolved and the types of construction methods that were used through time. So if you're modeling a certain era, you're not going to use more modern techniques or, or types of construction. So that was kind of my original intent. And I had developed a, a chart of eras of when you would you'd be able to go in and, and use like select type of building or select an era and then say, OK, I'm not going to put up a metal, a pre-engineered metal building on my, you know, 8, 1910 layout because they didn't exist. So that was kind of the original idea. And I'd, at some point I'd like to get um, I'll try to get that chart published. I think it would be useful to people. That pretty much is the uh, second question as well. Can you describe the different methods of construction for different eras? Maybe you could go into that a little further. Um, yeah, so I was with the materials, you'll see that in the when I covered various dates in the presentation. So the idea would be that over time you had to change in the way things were built and the different types of materials. So, you know, a lot of stone and masonry would be if you were doing a, a Civil War era layout or you'd have timber bridges and things like that. So you wouldn't have um, steel because it didn't exist yet. You'd have wrought iron, cast iron. So it was the different eras. So then say you got to the, the 50s, you could have pretty much everything, but you wouldn't see like the modern veneer systems we use on the outside of buildings. Those were still coming in. You'd see a lot more brick bearing walls if you're doing, say, transition era into the newer things, but then you would have seen larger mills and steel buildings coming in. So the idea was to kind of talk about how structural, how structural engineering kind of influences what buildings look like and the, what they're built out of. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you model to the level of detail in this presentation to simulate the prototype? I, uh, supposed to, I, I, think... I would wonder if anyone could even do that in HO, for example. Yeah, that's true. I mean, but say you were building a mill and you wanted to show it interior detail, you could put some kind of, you know, trim around the top of the po columns or posts to show the bearing plates that we were showing in the pictures. Um, obviously, anything that's exposed, and we could, I could show some examples in a little while that show some, you know, where structure is exposed to view. So you'd want to, you could uh, have some interiors um, showing through your windows, or whatever, and it would be structurally appropriate that way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's an interesting one with piers getting larger on the outside. Is this an adaptation of the flying buttresses? The piers are buttresses, aren't they? Well, the flying buttresses, yeah, they had extra masonry piers that had extra supports that came across. So you've got um, like Gothic churches we're talking about. So I guess it is, but it's really back to that fundamental of the load is increasing. So the structure, the wall needs to get thicker. If they had put a separate set of piers with cross bracing or something, then I would, that would be what I would think of. Because the other mill that I showed has it that looks flat on the outside, but on the inside, the piers get thicker. So you have more, the windows are set out at the same place, but the brick just gets progressively thicker. Just like if you look at like the tallest building in Chicago that was before they came up with the steel skeleton frame, it's huge masonry walls on the, I think it's the Monadnock building in Chicago. Um, so it's just the pure weight of everything because you have such a heavy system. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a quote from the question. I am told my house has a double airspace in some of my exterior walls. I'm told mm -hmm. it is, quote, back plasters, unquote. Uh, what is that? And can you explain why that is done? Not something I'm familiar with. Okay. Um, sounds like the, I mean, it, if there's an airspace, that's a good thing because you want to create a thermal break. Um, a lot of what we do nowadays with veneers or different types of rain screen that architects do, you've got a way to create a, a break between the outside material and the inside. So it could be related to that. Depends on what climate that's in. You know. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do you know much about the way New York Central stations were constructed? Some seem to have held up better than others. I don't personally. Um, we're talking about just stations all of New York Central um because i'm not sure there were like quite a few different architects were involved in the stations usually although they tended to have a prototype you know prototypical setup but i'm not sure what the reference is to okay mm -hmm. that's all the questions i have here that people have sent in um okay 
Now, for the audience, uh, Bill has some additional slides to show. Uh, he's going to share the screen with us and uh, show those so, slides and so that's comment kind of, on them. Yeah, let me do that. And um, one second. Okay. So is that working? All right. Yes. So yeah, so this is uh, some prototype examples that I had in the presentation that I, I had taken out for time. But so what I wanted to do is just show a few examples of, of things I talked about and why you might want to model where you'd want to model something where it might be exposed to view. So here's a, a B&O roundhouse at West Virginia that had a, a cast iron frame with the wood roof framing and that those trusses that are pretty cool that are those I think we said are cast iron. No, those are probably wrought iron. Uh, but it was just an interesting way of seeing the interior and how that all looked inside of a roundhouse. So it showed some of these details, and it's all exposed to view if you were to do a section through that or, or have it, you know, an open portion, or maybe you modeled it to the only a portion of it, you could show the, the frame, you know, the interior. And it's this is, and then again, the era, because of the materials, you've got that, you know, wrought iron, cast iron columns mixed with the wrought iron uh, trusses, and it's just an interesting example. Um, another, is this one of those roundhouses that had the turntable inside? I'm um, sorry. Let me go back to it. Yeah, I believe it, it did was fully covered. Yeah, you can see that in the the picture on the left. Yep, I don't know the exact uh, roundhouse it is, but then I had this was um, an example just locally to where I live. Um, just walking on the rail trail, <laughs> which would have been the Boston and Main Line. Um, you can see that the one of the mills there. You can see the truss inside the building from the outside. So it's just an idea that. Here's an example of where you can see the structure expressed from the exterior, even though you really can't see anything else in that building. You can see there's a truss there. So I just thought that was kind of a cool, you know, something you could see if you were, if that was still an active rail line, that would be something you could see. Something you would model, which you would see through the window. Yeah, exactly. These were just some other examples of some of uh, the rock face block that I talked about that used to be popular. So um, these are some mills in Connecticut that um, had that that one big mill that's closer to us was all this rock face block that it looks like stone, but it's it's all concrete block. So it was just kind of, it, cause they were really trying to make it look like a stone masonry when they first came out with that concrete product. So I just, just want to show that as another example. And what era was that? That would be the, that should have been probably early 1900s, mm -hmm. 19, yeah, I have my cheat sheet here. So that was the 19, I think 1910s, 1920s was really when it mm -hmm. came into being. You can see that in, there's examples around the Boston area where there's whole neighborhoods where the, the houses have a lot of that mm -hmm. rock face block or or they'll have, um, so the houses might be older, their garage that was built, you know, when the cars started becoming, you know what I mean? They were built the one car garages and they would make them out of those same block. Understood. Yep. Next one I had was just, this is a different type of stone mill and it just thought it was pretty neat with the uh, cut stone is very thin layering of stone there and then you've got but then they you know they added a nice chimney a big chimney later and that's got like a glazed brick and then of course we have to have the uh, let's see is that a bathroom or some other thing we have where the wood is could be they added a bathroom or something like that outside the footprint of the building but just an example i had so those are what I had. I just wanted to show those some, some examples, things. Thank you very much. There. Okay. Thank you. I'm gonna, yep, I'm gonna stop the sharing now. So hopefully that worked. All right. So any but any other things you're interested in, or because I mean I was trying, as I said, when I did this, I was just trying to explain structural behavior and properties and why we do certain things that we do and why things are built that way. So. The idea was to then be able to have modelers, you know, understand that when they're doing something. So hopefully that was useful. Are you? Um, well, you know? I, I see another another question that uh, came okay. in on the uh, chat. Sure. It was, it was in reference to the New York Central stations. Okay. This individual says, I know the one the Central New York Club was in. It was just a sunken post foundation, which made it not hold up well. Okay. I was just curious if it made a roll like that. 
I don't know, sunken post. So it wasn't piles, because when we do use timber piles, but if they had, if that's the central, I think I've been to that. So that was some, um, it could be just depending on how the local customs were when they built it, um, that they may have done the timber, you know, a wood frame, depending on the cost or how, you know, if it wasn't a major station. But yeah. I mean, you know, significant structures that say in Boston use timber piles underneath, as long as they stay under the water table, they do pretty well, so. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much, Bill. That brings us to the end of this uh, uh, part of the program. Um, we have uh, two tips and tricks coming up. One is on copper roofs by Chuck Diljack, MMR. And the next one is on rail fanning commuter trains by John Silhavy. Um, speed, you can roll the video.
on many model railroads, the viewer is looking down on the structures of a layout. Because of this, it is important to make your roofs interesting. This can be done with details such as chimneys, piping, machinery, water towers, and more. Textures is another way of making roofs interesting with different types of shingles, corrugated metal, rolled roofing, gravel, and metal seamed roofing. And with a variety of roofing materials comes a variety of colors. Hello, my name is Chuck Diljack of the Garden State Division, and in this NERX Tips and Tricks segment, I will cover the construction and finish of a copper seamed roof. As copper ages, it develops a blue-green covering called patina, which happens because of oxidation and sun exposure. There is currently no exact science to predict the color or time frame that patina will occur with copper. In some climates, the patina will turn a rich green, in other environments it will maintain a dark bronze look for decades. In this image, you can see the various shades of a green patina and brown. This is the look I want to duplicate. The material I like to use is metal roofing from evergreen scale models. It comes in four sizes, which are the spacing between the seams or ribs. 3 16 is the smallest and is what I like to use for my HO scale layout. Each package includes a 40 thousandths thick sheet with grooves cut into it. Also included are 10 by 30 thousandths strip styrene that need to be glued into those grooves. FlexiFile has a very nice system to help glue the strips into the grooves. This set includes a liquid solvent cement similar to 10X7R. There is also a touch and flow tool which consists of a very fine needle attached to a glass tube. Also included is an applicator bottle, which we will also use. To use the system, remove the touch and flow applicator from its protective package and lay it down in a cradle that prevents it from rolling off the workbench. Remove the cap to the adhesive bottle. Remove the needle applicator from the plastic applicator bottle. Insert the tip of the applicator bottle into the end of the touch and flow applicator. Insert the touch and flow needle into the adhesive bottle and squeeze the applicator bottle. You will see bubbles appear in the bottle of adhesive. Slowly release the applicator bottle, allowing it to pull the adhesive into the tube. Once you have enough adhesive in the tube, leave the tip of the touch and flow needle in the adhesive while removing the applicator bottle. Remove the touch and flow applicator from the adhesive bottle and lay it down horizontally in the cradle. The adhesive will remain in the tube. So here is my roof model. It is a hip roof with four panels. I added 40 by 40 thousand styrene for ridge caps where each panel meets. I also made sure each panel has the grooves aligned where they meet adjoining panels along the ridges. When they align, they look right to your eye. So let's install the styrene strips in the grooves. Be sure to wear nitrile gloves as protection when working with the adhesive. Each of the 10 by 30 thousand styrene strips were trimmed on one end to match the angle of the roof. This trimmed end will butt up against the ridge caps. To install the strip styrene, touch the applicator to a groove in several places. The adhesive will flow into the groove due to capillary action. Then insert the strip styrene. Continue doing this until all of the strips have been installed and set it aside to cure. Once cured, trim off the ends. Then it is on to painting. The acrylic paints we will use for the roof include an undercoat of roof brown, which will represent the bronze look of copper as it ages. Micromark, an NMRA partner, used to have roof brown in their Microlux airbrush paints as item 29009, but as of this production, it is no longer in their catalog. Since Microlux paints are Vallejo paints rebranded and bottled in larger bottles, I found that model railroad hobbyists identify the equivalent of roof brown in the Vallejo paint line as NATO brown in its model air product as item 71.249. The final treatment is a wash made from the folk art line of craft paints by Platt. Wouldn't you know it, they actually have a color called patina, color number 444. You can find this color in most craft stores. To start, the roof was airbrushed the color of roof brown or nato brown, depending on which brand of acrylic paint you have. I suggest also painting scrap pieces of styrene sheet with roof brown to use for testing the consistency of the patina paint before applying it to your model. The patina craft paint will need to be thinned. 
The thinner it is, the more brown will show through. But if it is too thin, it will run right off the roof model. I use a soft, round brush when applying the paint. A soft, flat brush can be used also. When painting each panel between the ribs, you want to paint the full length of the panel in one brush stroke. Begin by applying paint along the ridge caps, then start with the smallest panels on the ends and work your way to the middle where the panels are longer. If you start with a larger panel and then a smaller one next to it, you may leave a noticeable brush stroke on the larger panel that is not the length of the panel. If any air bubbles appear on the model as a result of thinning the paint or brushing the paint on, just use your brush to pull the air bubble off the model. Keep the roof level as you paint and when letting it dry. Here is the Magnuson Models Firehouse Kit that I built and was shown during last year's NERX. You can see all of the roofing details, textures, and colors with the flag, siren, chimney, antenna, rolled roofing, and copper seamed roofing. In this photo from directly above, you can see the copper seamed roof more clearly. The patina wash allows the bronze color of the copper roof to show through, just as in the prototype photo shown earlier. And that's it for this Tips and Tricks segment.
Well, that wraps up our last day of content for this year's NERX. On behalf of the NER board, I want to thank all of the volunteers that gave their time to making this event possible, especially Chuck Diljack, Ed O'Rourke, Ed Olszewski, Dave Doerr, James Van Bokelen, Peter Watson, John During, Chris Carfaro, Greg Williams, and Artie Cass, Crass, excuse me, Artie, uh, and especially Speed Muller, who operated the studio. Uh, thanks also to the National NMRAX crew, and uh, I think Ed O'Rourke, our president, has some words for us. Just a few words. Thanks, all of you who uh, joined us this week for NERX. Um, we'll see you next in September in Rochester. I hope you can all come over there, get over onto the NER website and register for the convention if you haven't done so already. Lots of good stuff going on there. And plan on being back here in March next year. Um, if you've got a clinic you'd like to get going on, get in touch with us and we'd be glad to feature you. We'd be glad to feature your layout or your trick and tip or anything else that you have model railroading uh, related. Get in touch with us. Thanks, folks. Night now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Thanks, folks. Steve.